If we could have everybody have a seat that's coming to the that's coming to the town hall meeting. Wow, that's, that's pretty good attention. That's I appreciate that. That's impressive. Thank you all. David, are we good? Sorry, Laura, David. Okay, thumbs up. Um, first, I want to thank you all for coming out. My name is Stephen Berry. I'm the county commissioner for Escambia County District 5. I uh, want to welcome you all. If you haven't been here before to the, uh, we call it the Old Molino Community Center. Many of you would have known it as the old elementary school that was here for many of you that have been out here for many years. Um, but the uh, Mid-County Historic Society, I see the president, Sarah Janess, had walked in. She may have walked out. They have a historic society meeting as well tonight. But there are nonprofit. I'm sorry. There she is, Sarah. Um, there are nonprofit partner that runs the facility for us. Um, uh, they do that uh, with you know, no expense to the county, but providing a lot of uh, a lot of community benefits. So the majority of the things that you see go on out here are uh, a function of that Mid County Historic Society. So if you live in the community, I know that they rely on a relatively small group of volunteers, and uh, it's. Uh, it's a very good use of your time if you, if you do have the time to be able to give. Um, I want also welcome uh, Kevin Stevens, which is the District 5 ECUA representative here tonight. Thank him for coming out. And uh, the state representative from District 1, Michelle Salzman, is en route. Um, I believe that she is going to be uh, here in some, in some relatively timely fashion. So when she gets here, I'm going to ask her if uh, uh, she'd like to take a few minutes and just, you know, give a few words about what's, what went on in the session, uh, you know, kind of finishing her first year in office. Um, and after I speak uh, for a couple minutes, I'm going to let Kevin do the same thing, talk a little bit about his first year at ECUA and kind of what's, uh, what's going on there. And then hopefully uh, Michelle and Kevin both will stay and uh, answer questions if anybody from the audience has any questions for them as well. You're welcome to, uh, welcome to ask them. I'm sure they'll do the best they can. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce the folks from the county. Uh, on the end, Eric Gilmore is a public safety, public safety director. Wes Moreno is a public works director, is also serving as an interim county administrator currently. Rob McCracken is here from engineering, and Rob has uh, uh, the majority of the information related to specific projects that are going on in the district. Uh, Joy Jones, the, uh, the county engineer, is, is out this week, so Rob is serving in her stead and has uh, quite a bit of information. I want to thank all the information you've gotten to our office the last couple of days. And uh, for my office, my administrative aide, Don Trosh, is here, and my intern, Dylan Conti, um, is here as well. And uh, before we kind of give a couple of uh, opportunities to speak, I want to mention one thing that is relatively news that I certainly think is good news. It's uh, the first type of this kind of thing I've really been able to bring forward uh, since being in office, especially specific to this project. But um, I believe on July 8th, I'm going to have a letter of intent coming from an employer uh, related to a project in the Central Commerce Park, which is going to be uh, very close to where Quintet Road dead ends in Highway 29. Um, they're looking at more or less 75 acres, um, 150, 200 jobs during the first year and $20 million of private capital uh, getting, put into the, getting put into the project. Um, it also involves no out-of-pocket money from the county, so uh, I'm really excited. Hopefully, you know, see that, hopefully see that letter of intent very soon, and hopefully we'll have that on the agenda for discussion with my colleagues on July 8th. So I think that's cer certainly something that we can uh, you know, take a lot of pride in. That's something that's a very good thing. Uh, specifically for District 5, but also broadly for Escambia County, especially when it involves no, no out-of-pocket county money. Um, one person from the county I would like to, to come up and speak a little bit. Eric Gilmore, if you don't mind coming up. We're also anticipating on July 8th, um, uh, Eric is currently over emergency management systems and the fire, uh, and the fire department, and um, uh, there's been quite a bit of board discussion and things about emergency management or EMS. And I believe we're going to have a uh, memorandum of understanding that's going to come to the board on the 8th with some really good news in it about the direction of EMS. So I did ask Eric if he'd take, you know, just two or three minutes and, you know, kind of outline what he anticipates that being. So, Eric. Thank you, Commissioner Berry, for having me here tonight. I uh, just want to share with you guys some things we've got going on with EMS. Uh, first and foremost, I know the big hot topic was waiting calls low manpower accounts, crews, 
Well, we've hired a new EMS uh, chief. His name is David Torsell from Alachua County. And since he's been here in three and a half weeks, he's brought accountability back to the system, which has been long needed. So that's been a breath of fresh air and getting us back on track. Uh, so we got crews actually in the, on the road like they're supposed to be answering calls. Now we're still holding calls. We're fixing the pay. The pay has gone up for our paramedics. It'll start at 19, 19 an hour. So we should see an influx of paramedics coming in. We've been trying to compete with the uh, AMR and the lifeguard systems east and west of us, which, of course, they, if they pay $22 an hour without benefits, uh, as a young person, an EMT and a paramedic, they want the, the money right now. So we're being competitive with our uh, counterparts east and west of us, and uh, we're getting manpower uh, coming back to the county. So uh, we're hoping to staff more ambulances a little bit down the road. We want to get to where we're about 20 ambulances during the daytime and 15 at night. That will get us where we need to where we need to be. Right now, we're trying to do 15 at the daytime. We're getting 12 to 15, and we're trying to get 10 right now at night. And we're around seven to eight, sometimes uh, six, and we have to call in extra manpower for mandatory. So we're trying to fix those gaps. We're really trying to get that. Let me tell you something. First and foremost, I live up here too. My family lives up here. I've been here all my life, and I'm, I'm dedicated to make this happen so that nobody has any issues with the EMS system or the fire system. Uh, I've been in the county, been doing the county stuff for 25 years as a district volunteer fire chief with McDavid, and uh, this is near and dear to my heart. And I want to make sure that we get it right for you guys, for my family, for your family, and that we don't let anything fall off the side, okay? So first and foremost, I want to put that at ease. So um, prioritization is operations. We will make sure we have people in the field doing the operations. On July the 8th, um, we are going to look at a different direction with our e uh, EMS medical direction. Um, I've had an opportunity. It came to me in April, and uh, it was, sounded too good to be true, so I sat down with some uh, doctors from the University of Florida, and they came in and sat down, and we discussed the possibility of going under a training contract, medical direction contract with those guys. So on July the 8th, I'm bringing to the board to, board to vote to uh, partner or contract with the University of Florida. While doing, while, when we go with University of Florida, not to say our paramedics and our EMTs are not trained and certified, they are trained and certified, this will give us another level, another degree of, of training, certification, that will get us even more further down the road and allow us to actually build upon what we have now and make the system even better. So we're going to go with three medical directors. Uh, the medical director in the county will be Dr. Gordon, who lives in, our, he lives in the Gulf Breeze, so he'll be here locally. We have Dr. Alexanderoff will be our co-medical director, and then Dr. Fitzpatrick will be, he's uh, out of UF, so he'll remain down there, but he's available by phone. But we'll have two medical directors here in the area. Contracting with UF affords us the opportunity to bring in all types of training in now. So we can actually get a baseline training for our EMS personnel, uh, identify the gaps, fill those gaps, and then build upon advanced stuff, such as uh, we can do... Um, uh, advanced uh, airways on the trucks, we can do, uh, bring in where we can do ultrasounds on the trucks. Uh, so the, the opportunities that we're bringing to the county and trying to make this system a much better system. In 2003, your Scambi County EMS system was the provider of the year. There's no reason we can't get that again, and that's what we're wanting to do, and that's what Dave Trussell is trying to bring to the uh, organization. He wants to be the top organization in the, in the state of Florida again. We're going to get there. We got the pay there, we got the personnel there, we'll get more personnel, and with this contract, we'll be better prepared and better trained and be able to go do advanced stuff. So I'm excited about the opportunity that we've got coming forward. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, they have, so Dr. Gordon, he works for, for city, he works for Fulton Beach Medical Center. So right there, it, he, as far as privileges in the county, not yet, but we're working to get them privileges in the county because they're going to be working with our hospital system. They're going to be working with Sacred Heart, West Florida, and Baptist Hospital. So we're going to get those guys in here and make sure they're tied in with our local hospital system. Yes, ma'am. now asked for training and she was um, not, not given it because it was sole sourced it sounds like this is a sole source contract also okay I can't so I can't speak 2019 what happened I'm just trying to fix the system now and go forward okay. was it put but out to bid is my question that's a good question to local area providers that's a good question like that. because we're contracting with a state university system it, we don't have to go out for bid because we're, we're uh, contracting with the state interesting thank you yes ma'am 
Thank you for the questions. Thank you for your time. And he lives on State Line Road, so he's, he's not necessarily getting to leave yet. If you do have questions after, uh, after this initial part, you're certainly going to be welcome to ask that as well. Um, and I apologize, I didn't see uh, Bruce Woody, the Executive Director of ECUA, came in as well. And um, Bruce, after, after Kevin makes some comments, you're welcome to make some comments as well. Uh, you know, I appreciate you being here. Um, but Kevin, please. So Kevin Stevens, ECUA District 5, um, and I want to thank you, Stephen, for, for, for having me to answer any questions. So I've uh, been on board since November, so what a wild ride, my first uh, elected office. So a lot to learn, I've learned a lot, still have a tremendous amount to learn. Um, as you all know, you know, we've got pretty much a complete um, new administration. So we've got a new director, uh, Mr. Bruce Woody, which happens to be joining us here. We have a new attorney, and we have two newly elected board members. So uh, um, tremendous amounts of uh, tremendous amounts of turnover. Um, what we've done so far is just, uh, again, you know, bringing more accountability, more transparency. Um, we've updated our website, so hopefully it's going to be easier for you all to find things. I know I get asked about the budget um, pretty frequently. So uh, this budget, uh, so the 2020 budget uh, is published. The 2021 is not. I had a few questions um, asked about that. We haven't voted on that. We haven't approved that yet. So as soon as that gets voted on and approved, that will actually be made public. Um, so, so the new budget. Um, some new improvements we have. Probably the number one uh, phone call I get or email I get is a missed garbage pickup or a mixed, missed uh, bulk uh, uh, pickup. So I probably get, uh, I see some heads nodding in there in the crowd. So, uh, I, you know, again, I, I've, I've done a very good job, I believe, at setting the expectation, um, you know, with, uh, with uh, Mr. Woody's help is, you all call me, I give you my email address, I say please send me the name, address, phone number of the location. Um, I've talked to probably several of you here already, and I forward that to Mr. Woody, I copy the, the, uh, the corresponding department head, I'm a big believer in inspect what you expect, and, uh, and I'm, I usually have resolution um, back within 24 hours. So thus far, knock on podium, I haven't had any issues about getting the, that garbage picked up. Um, bulk garbage pickups, you know, when I first, before, uh, prior to me coming on, I was thinking those were full-time employees, right, the bulk garbage pickup, and wasn't aware that we hired actually day labor. As you all right, uh, know right now, day labor or any late labor is hard to come by. So please bear with us uh, right now. We're, 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 there's some proposals to um, entice um, some of our day labor to come on, uh, um, as well as um, hiring additional drivers. So that's been a big issue right now. Our guys are working, most of our uh, guys and, and girls are working uh, overtime to keep up. So we're shorthanded on drivers. Um, so I can assure you that they're, 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 they're not taken out. We're just shorthanded. We're like everybody else. Uh, and just like the private sector, it's difficult for us to uh, recruit top talent as well. So we desperately need some CDL drivers. And so if you all out there uh, are looking for a great opportunity or a great place to work, please uh, uh, send your uh, resume to us. We, we'd, we'd love to look at it. So we've got some several different proposals. Um, uh, once we, we've also instituted a new GPS system. So I wasn't we're kind of in um, back in the 21st century now. I couldn't I couldn't understand why you uh, would miss a garbage pickup. <laughs> um, so again, with the uh, the technology we have today, so now we've got we're implementing that technology which is being rolled out now. So our drivers will have that in their trucks. I'm thinking within the next four to six months that should be fully implemented. Fingers crossed. Um, so then it's going to be very difficult uh, for an individual to miss. Uh, not impossible, <laughs> but it's going to be more difficult for a driver to miss a garbage pickup. You know, District 5 is truly the tale of two cities because on the uh, north or south of Canton, everybody is, is, is sewer to, uh, septic conversion. Everybody wants to uh, be on the uh, sewer system. You get north of Cantonment, um, fewer folks are wanting to be on the sewer system. So I remember I kind of uh, stepped in a, a proverbial landmine at Jimmy's Grill during a campaign speech, and I'm talking about bringing infrastructure up 29, and we're just going to these improvements, and I had a whole lot of uh, um, unhappy folks. Uh, so I was like, wow, okay, I'm thinking I'm doing a good thing. Of course, Jimmy, you know, good buddy of mine, he was all for it. He's like, hell yeah, man, or, or heck yeah, man. I, I uh, definitely would like to have that um, for, for my restaurant. I'm having to get a new drain fill system. Them. So businesses obviously are all for it. Residences, you know, not necessarily. Um, I'm on about 40 acres myself, so I, I, I understand. <laughs> My septic system works perfectly fine. Um, 
but again, you know, it, it, is, it is a project. In fact, I was talking to uh, my director today, as a matter of fact, about, about doing some forecasting on bringing some infrastructure uh, up 29. Obviously, we can't do that um, without state and federal help, so we're working on that. Um, I've, I've worked very closely. I'm very blessed to have a good relationship with Representative Salzman. So, in fact, I was talking to her on my way up here um, about uh, getting some state help, some matching funds. So we're applying for uh, millions of dollars of matching funds. Uh, the trick is we have to have half of that. <laughs> we have to have half of that in the kitty. So uh, for us to apply for some of these funds, which is almost like a buy one, get one, right? Um, if, we, if, we, if, we're apply if we're wanting a $2 million project done, um, we have to have a million of that to offset it. So uh, again, uh, not to open up a can of worms here, but you all are probably aware of we've had a, um, we had a preliminary vote, uh, talked about a rate increase. And, and um, so I would encourage you all to please come. It's the last Tuesday of the month. So the, se the third Tuesday of the month is our citizen advisory committee. Uh, and then the last Tuesday of the month is our board meeting. So that's about to go into committee. And, um, and then we will go into a lot more explanation on um, if that gets passed, what are we getting? Because at the end of the day, it's like, okay, where's the money going? Um, that's the magical question, and what are we getting for that? And will our services improve and so forth? So um, I'll be happy to, like I said, answer some of those questions um, uh, next month, um, as well as if you call me or email me or whatever the case may be. So I don't want to take up too much time, but um, pleasure serving you. Hopefully, I I'm very easy to get a hold of, so please call me. I mean, I do a Blab TV. I'm doing a Blab TV show tomorrow, by the way. I'm going to talk in detail about the budget and potential because nothing has been approved yet rate increases and if those are approved what they'll mean for uh, all of us and the specifics so that's going to be a, a blab tv uh, show shameless plug on that so please tune in if you get an opportunity i'm also going to put that on youtube and facebook and so forth so you can actually get a very detailed description of when i have that budget the proposed budget in front of me going over that uh line by line um email me um, I, I've got uh, K Stevens at dist5.com, so please uh, feel free to email me. I'm, uh, those of you all who email knows I'm very easy, very easy to get a hold of via phone. I return calls within 24 hours. I pride myself on that, usually within 12. Uh, and I return an email back same day, maybe 9 or 10 o'clock at night after I put the kids to bed. Um, and, uh, but I will, and after I watch the news, <laughs> a little decompression, but I will uh, email you back that evening. So K Stevens, S T E P H E N S, at dist IST5.com. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, do I have any uh, uh, general questions? Yes, ma'am. It absolutely was. And, and, and you know, it's interesting, I'm, and thank you for bringing that up. I remember, I remember at uh, Jimmy's Grill uh, at a campaign, and I, I was asked that question, you know, if elected, will you raise rates? And I guess the easy question would be, no, I won't. And my, I, my question was this, and my uh, response to that question was this, the same it is now. Um, I'm going to look at all the information. I'm going to look at the budget. First, I'm going to look at ECUA, and I'm going to find out where, where we can cut cost. Um, uh, we're going to look at our house first. So where can we cut things when it comes to waste, uh, when it comes to inefficiencies, redundancies, overlap, that sort of thing, uh, when it comes to, uh, like I said, spending? You know, that, 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 that's our big thing. If, if I've done the best I can do when it comes to cutting spending, looking at budging, restructuring our debt load, and we still, I mean, keep in mind, there's a, about a $150 million uh, uh, um, uh, DP consent order that, we, that we're you know, putting money back in the kitty to, to uh, pay for. Um, uh, if I can't find the money through uh, cutbacks, then absolutely, I mean, I, I would vote for one. Um, but not willy-nilly and not knowing where the money's gonna go to. Uh, to vote for a rate increase, to say we're gonna raise everybody's rates, X amount of percentage. Um, didn't wanna get into a whole lot of the rate increase here. Um, but uh, the proposal's 9% ish. Um, it's going back and forth. We, we, I don't think we've decided on a final number quite yet, and that works out to be about $3 a month. I'm not knocking $3 a month being a little bit of money. I know with gas prices, food prices, everything is going up. Labor cost is going up. Um, $3 is nothing to, to, to scoff at. But, uh, but again, I, I try to do as much due diligence, being a businessman myself, to look at the financials, P&Ls, balance sheets, and if I can't find the money anywhere else, um, uh, the, big, uh, um, the, big, the largest portion of that rate increase, again, not trying to go into a lot of detail about that today, um, is going to be for, for salaries for uh, CDL drivers and, um, and uh, uh, 
uh, bulk pickup uh, workers and so forth. Um, I told my other board members um, there is a crisis right now, um, not just in the private sector, we're all feeling it, business owners in the private sector. Um, you know, our biggest competition right now for hiring and keeping, retaining, because I want those, I want those six to eight a week calls I get from missed garbage pickups not to turn into 16 or 20. And if we don't retain our current employees we have there right now, that's going to increase. Um, so uh, again, um, I voted uh, for uh, a rate increase targeted um, where, where it goes towards salaries to CDL drivers and some other uh, key individuals. Um, so yes. And then my next question is you, during your campaign and, and just a few minutes ago, you talked about accountability and transparency. Yes, and yet we still, as District 5, where, which is where I live, yes, I, I live here, not, I don't vacation here, I live here seven days sure. a week. You're still on the fence as to where you live. Do you live here? Do you live okay. downtown? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm not on the fence. Uh, my residence is 9655 North Barth Road. So during Hurricane Sally, like most folks, um, it had extensive damage. I had two very large trees, which I think Google Earth will show you, um, follow my house. So my house uh, in, in, in Molino, where I've lived for 16 years, by the way, and brought both my children home from the hospital and raised my 10-year-old son and my 4-year-old daughter, um, is not livable right now. Um, sheet rocks gutted out. Um, uh, roof uh, uh, still has holes in it, still tarped up. I got blue tarps all over my roof. Um, I spend as much time out there as I can because that is my home. Um, that's my... That, that's, that will always be my home. Um, Okay. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. I don't need to. Okay. So, so, so let me answer this without getting, so I own lots of companies. I own several residences. I don't think that my economic status um, should play a role in whether I run for office. I donate my salary back to District 5 in charity, so not to get into some of the details, but I don't take a salary from ECUA. I get paid a salary, that gets donated back. MANA, ver various veterans organizations. So, so again, when it comes to being public service as a Rotarian, service above self, that's what I'm doing. So I'm putting my proverbial money where, mouth, where, where my mouth is. Um, I, I, again, I, own, I have a residence downtown. That's my wife's office where she has her practice. I've got, I've got other residences outside of that. Um, the, the statute is reside, so where do I live? So up until Hurricane Sally, that's where I, that's where I lived 24-7. Uh, my wife commuted my son back and forth to school. So that is, I, I, I don't know any other way how to answer your question. Um, uh, what's that? Um, so, so the property value, yeah, okay. The property value for the residents downtown far exceeds the property value uh, in Molino. So that was the business decision I made on that house. That's a simple business, and that's what I do. As far as my ownership in, in various companies, I, again, I have several companies. It makes me real good at financials. Debt schedules. Well, I'm, I'm just curious, what tax base are you talking about? I pay taxes on my house in Molino. I pay. No, I'm just, I'm just, well, no, no ma'am, I'm not trying to be just, I'm just saying, what are you talking about? This, this is a, ma'am, ma'am, this is a District 5 meeting, and I'm, I'm coming here representing you all right now at District 5. I don't know what else I can do. Any, any and any event that, that corresponds to District 5, I come to I-10, whether I'm staying temporarily downtown or, praise God, the insurance works out to where I'm able to move back in my house in the next, in the next four to six months. But again, I'm representing you. When, you. when you call, I answer your phone. When you send me an email, I reply to it. When uh, I, 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 would, I would challenge, I spend as much, if not uh, more time, than any other board member in the history of ECUA uh, 
on, on trying to eliminate debt, uh, eliminate waste, um, bring transparency and accountability. So, you know, I, I started out serving my country, um, and now the whole purpose of me running, it sure, it sure wasn't the money, again, that I donate back to the district. It was, it, 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 it was putting, it was putting my, okay, thank you. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Sure. Yes, sir. And we do. We do. I'm okay. I'm, I'm good. Okay. Uh, thank you. It's been a lot of people. But I'll be, I'm not hesitant to point out shortcomings. But on sure. the other side of that, Ricky Shelby, I mean, Ricky Fretwell does an absolute. Thank problem. you for that. Now, I'm, I'm, the last thing you want is your, your tenants having to deal with garbage all over. Sure. And we are missing pickup. But we all know how difficult it is to get help right now. I mean, it is tough. Very, I'm very you, difficult. I'm just telling you. Ricky Fretwell has gotten in the truck himself and come out to my complex and pick, pick garbage up uh, himself, himself. So you'll pass that on and tell him. I, I, I will do that. Like I said, th and thank you so much, sir, for that. Any other questions? Sanitary sewer layout, sanitary sewer systems. It seems that... Uh, the way we're going now is low pressure systems rather than the old pump station because the pump stations have gotten so expensive that very few people can afford them. Is that the future of ECUA on sewer now is for land development, is low pressure sewer systems? You know, that, that's a good one. I would almost defer, I would almost defer to my director, uh, Mr. Woody on that and just call him. Would you mind answering that, Mr. Woody? Yeah, my, my name is Bruce Woody. I'm the new uh, executive director with the ECUA. Um, and uh, my, my background is uh, engineering. I'm a licensed professional engineer. I will say that uh, whenever possible, it is always to both, uh, to, uh, is always to the advantage of both the customer as well as the operator of the system to have gravity sewer service. That is always the goal, hands down. Uh, what uh, what really drives those kinds of decisions, however, are uh, topography and um, economics, uh, depending on uh, whether the gravity source system is in the area and can be extended uh, economically if there's enough folks to, to tie onto it, if there aren't uh, um, uh, challenges with the topography, uh, bodies of water, groundwater table, all those sorts of things that, that drive those decisions. But gravity sewer service is always the first goal and the first thing we look at. There seems to be a lot of them going in. And are they being monitored by ECUA or are these private systems? Uh, the low pressure sewer system, uh, the state of Florida requires there to be what's called a continuing authority. Uh, a responsible party for the capture, conveyance, pumping, and treatment of the waste. So the only portion that is the responsibility of the private property owner is the, the grinder pump at the home and the connection to the force main that's right there in the front of their property. Uh, once it is connected to the ECUA's low pressure sewer force main, it is the responsibility of ECUA and it is monitored and taken care of there. Uh, but this portion on your private property obviously is yours. All right, Kevin. Thank you. Thank Let's you, go Bruce. ahead and tell everybody how much you're going to raise the rates. What's Are that? you proposed to raise the rates 12%, 9.5% for sanitation, and 2.5% rate increase for sewer? Now, you haven't raised the impact fees. The impact fees are only going to be $3 million proposed, but you get $148 million plus out of us ratepayers in revenue. Now that's very lopsided. I'm for the developers, but I think it should be a lot more equal, and I don't think you're being equal about this, and I think there's a lot of projects that you should have looked at before you even proposed this ridiculous idea of raising rates that you promised not to do. You promised not to do this, but you're doing it now. 
ridiculous. You should have looked at some of these projects and say, wait a minute, maybe instead of GPS for the trucks first, maybe we should take care of the employees' pay rate. Now, is there any even a guarantee that all that rate increase, which you say is very little, and if it's very little, why don't you put that on the developers instead of us rate payers, if it's so little. But now that you've already gone there with that, you should look at some of these projects, cut a project, like we just said, you got the new GPS system in the trucks. Maybe the pay rate for the employees should have gone first to show that you care more about the employees than a GPS system, because even if you pay the employees $19, $22 an hour, they're still going to miss garbage cans. And that's just a fact. And you know it. So I've been trying to have kid gloves with you on this, but I'm absolutely furious. There should have been a lot more transparency, and now the promise that you made is null and void, and you're not even into this for a year yet. Go back, please. As I'm your boss to you, go back, look at a project that you're going to ax. Don't raise the rates 9.5%. 9 raise them to zero, but give those employees the money that they need and for recruitment. And you can do that. I looked at the projects today, and I looked at the ridiculous amount of debt that ECUA has. Quit spending. Figure out your priority. Is it the employees and the ratepayers? Is that priority? Or is it going out and buying the new shiny object? Is that more important? A lift station should be put more on the developers, and the developers are also, don't want to have a pun here, but they're also taxing the main system that we haven't even finished paying for yet. Right. Okay. So, so thank you, Sean, for that for that question. So uh, I'll I'll respond and 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 well, there's probably about three or four questions there. So I'm gonna see if I can if I can re recant all of them. First of all, you talked about impact fees using impact fees to offset the rate increase. So we can't do that as a as a public utility. We cannot. It's not legal for us to raise impact fees to offset costs in, in other divisions. So for example, we're trying to increase the pay of our CDL drivers and some of our laborers, which again, so is every other employer uh, uh, in America. Um, we can't u utilize any of that money. So the way, the way the, how that works is on the impact fees is the builder developer pay 100% of the impact. So it's proportionate fee. So any improvement uh, any impact that that developer has on that, uh, and I can tell you, I get calls from builders and developers weekly about the enormous and outrageous amounts of money that they're paying, and then that $30,000 lot that they're going to sell to the consumer is now 50000 So it's a double-edged sword, but we cannot legally, uh, and again, the impact fees are pretty, are, are pretty uh, intense, a $25,000 lot now to develop is on average, and I'm just getting this from some of the developers, thirty-five dollars to $40,000. But we can't move money from, uh, it could be a great idea just to no, move no, money from the, imp, from, from the developers and, and no, offset costs. No, no, I did not say move money. I'm not going to play the shell game today. Okay. I'm going to be straightforward with all sure. of you officials, elected officials. You know you could increase it and take more of the costs that you would have to be putting from the general fund in there that the developers are drawing money from you would have more money left in the general to move over to pay for employees. You, you, you can't move money. You can't move money from the development end over into the general fund to offset costs in any shape. I mean, so, so again, when, when those hundred lots, I'm just using a round number, are developed, the builder has paid 100% for that lift station, not a proportionate amount for the lift station. Not only has the developer paid for the lift station, but in a lot of cases, it has been that the entire system has been upgraded at the builder developer's expense, where ECUA and the other residents of Escambia County are able to benefit from tying into that. Um, so, uh, and then of course, the, the new homeowners of that hunter lot are gonna be paying for the garbage. But, but to, put a, to put a, first of all, you can't do it, but to put an increase, uh, an impact fee onto a developer who is not benefiting from that, that uh, a trash pickup, the new homeowner will, uh, again, it's somewhat of a non-issue, Sean, because it's it, it, we can't. It's not legal to do it. Um, when you when you, when I talked about to your point about raising rates, um, I, I'm I'm going to reiterate what I told this, this young lady up front is 
I'm not willy-nilly raising rates. I understand I'm, we're talking about proposing, again, we're talking about the neighborhood of 9%-ish. Right, 9.5, right. Um, so combine both of those, in, uh, both those percentages, if approved, if passed, would be about $3. And I'm not negating $3 is a lot of money. Because again, with food costs, gas costs, I'm very cognizant of that. But I also know that if we don't take care of our drivers, to the GPS system you're talking about, I'm trying to eliminate as much as I can uh, the angst that I get. So I can't speak for other, uh, um, I can't speak for the other board members on one through four, but the number one call I get are missed driver pickups and bulk uh, garbage pickup by far. The, 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 and I'm, I'm answering calls at eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night. Um, I think we've had conversations probably at nine or 10 o'clock at night um, on various ECOA issues. So um, if I can eliminate that um, uh, or, or I can prevent that from increasing, by retaining our drivers, um, and to answer your question, yes, we have agreed that that money, any increase, if approved, would be targeted to employee pay. Not maybe, not general fund, but targeted. In fact, it was specifically designated um, for em employee raises. Um, CDLs and, and, then, and then other individuals that labor as a result of bolt pickups and so forth. Yes, we're, we're, we're going to give that to between Mr. Woody and Mr. Rudd, who handle the operations, the laborers. We're going, they're going to get with us uh, and let us know how that is dispersed. They're going to get with us and say, we're going to give $2, uh, $1.50 an hour, for example, to a CDL. This is going to go to the bolt driver pickups and so forth. But I can tell you definitively, if we don't, I mean, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm almost hoping I don't have any drivers here right now, but you know, at, at, at 14 50 an hour to start out with, um, it, you know, our biggest competitor to retain our employees, our drivers, the ones that are come picking up our garbage right now, is the private sector and the city. So the city gets wind of us uh, um, proposing, raising our uh, employees' pay, they instantly send out a proposal to one-up us. So we're literally competing against, which, which by the way, um, is 11% higher than we are. So city sanitation rates are 11% uh, cent higher. So even if the rate gets uh, passed and it's targeted to these individuals, we'll still be 3 to $4 less a month than what the city is paying. Our number one competitor, by the way, oh, we're tanning people. Uh, any other questions? I apologize. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So, just this month alone, I live out here in Molino, you've missed our recycling twice. I've called, and I called, our recycling comes on, on Tuesdays. Yes, ma'am. I called on Wednesday, and they said, oh, we'll send a truck out. That truck has never come again, so twice. Your website is not very friendly as far as downloading the app to say, hey, when's our you know, here, we've missed a pickup, you know, go online and, and do the app and say, we've missed it, which I did, and I called, and it hasn't been done yet, again. And when they do, when the drivers, I work from home, yes, and so when the trash pickups do come, nine times out of 10, the same trash truck that comes picks up my trash, and my recycle. So why am I putting my recycle and emptying out my cans and cleaning my glass jars, sure. putting in my recycle, and then the trash truck puts it in the same as the recycle? You also have taken the recycle bins at different facilities away from us. So why are you putting such an emphasis on recycling if you guys are not going to truly help us out with recycling? Okay, so, uh, uh, so you had, a, I think, about three-part questions. Let me see if I can give you a two- to three-part answer. So first of all, um, that shouldn't happen. Um, they should not, uh, if that's happening, and I don't, I don't dispute what you're saying at all, first of all, um, going into the, uh, the, the recycling one in the regular um, uh, uh, trash truck, um, that shouldn't happen. So please, um, you know, email me, name, address, phone number. I mean, I pretty much live on my phone. I'm a compulsive, compulsive workaholic, <laughs> as my wife will attest to. So 
Call me, email me, so I can get that resolved for you. We do take recycling uh, very seriously, which is why we're doing the Energy Star Awards, which is why we're, we're promoting it with the app. Um, the, hopefully, this GPS system, uh, hopefully it is going to work. I hope to God in heaven um, that it does improve stuff, or else we've just spent money for nothing. So at least there's going to be a lot more accountability when that GPS system happens, so I know when a, when a, um, when a, a trash pickup is missed. And again... My number one call um, is trash pickup. Um, working our guys right now, uh, 40, uh, 50 to 60 hours a week, working overtime. And that, that's basically right now, we're working pretty much all of our drivers overtime just to keep up with, um, just to keep up the trash pickup in bulk. Although I know it's a big deal to you all, so it's a big deal to me. I mean, again, we're having difficulty getting day laborers to pick up the bulk. But call me, email me, anybody, and I've got hundreds and hundreds of folks who have called and emailed me. Um, uh, will we'll tell you I'm pretty quick on the response, and I guarantee you, you call me, email me, give me name, address, and phone number, and when they miss it, I will have them out there the very next day uh, to pick it up. Right. So, so I'm going to have, because I know Mr. Woody is biting at the bit to answer that question real quick, but I will say I do know some issues that we have had, from just some of our drivers have, have gotten back with us, is all the individuals who are not putting recycling in there, right? Garbage and other debris and waste and so forth. So I hate to use the old cliche, you know, one person messes it up for everybody, but we've had a big issue with that at the, at the uh, off-site locations as opposed to your house. A real big problem with it. Um, but I will certainly have you further that explanation. A couple quick things about finding out and, and being in touch with our recycling program. Uh, there is an app out there called Recycle Coach. I would really encourage you to download that. Gives you some good information. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you found you know it that way. But, but, but it provides, but in general, it provides some good information about when, when your due dates are. It gives you an opportunity to be able to provide us some feedback by, by way of the app. Uh, number two, um, recycling is an important program to us, not only for uh, good in environmental reasons, but quite frankly, it is uh, cost effective. It, for every ton that we uh, are able to run through the recycling system, uh, that there's some cost avoidance, uh, not taking it to the, uh, to the landfill at a higher cost. So there's a financial incentive as well for us, for us to do that. Uh, the um, pickup locations was a partnership we had with the county. Uh, we did that uh, very successfully for a while. It, it did get abused, unfortunately, during the time of COVID. It also uh, uh, suffered. So I, we, we may well have more conversations about that in the future. I don't know. So, so and, and please, because I'm going to, this is Commissioner Barry's uh, uh, meeting. So. If, please email me uh, questions or, or call me. I will be happy to answer any of your questions any further. I just I, I don't want to be rude to Commissioner Barry, and it, this kind of turned yeah, into an ECUA meeting. Uh, but yeah, uh, one more. Sure. And, it, and it's not a hard, sure. It's not a hardball. I see why. I'm uh, used to them. I'm taking them all day, Larry. So just you just keep I see them coming. why Commissioner Barry invited you now. Yeah. <laughs> Take a little heat off. <laughs> uh, it, anyways, uh, I personally have a hard time believing that that the payoff for the recycling covers the resources manpower etc spent so in other words i don't believe that tonnage you know per right. ton offsets. i'll send you a breakdown i mean i could I go over, I, I could i could tell you it does but um i i'm a i'm a visual learner myself That's so like i want the, i want supporting documentation so i will i will uh i will email you um, a, uh, a breakdown uh, of, of that, but I can Thank tell you. Thank you so much. Yes. Oh, no, you go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, recycling is a challenge. Uh, in, in most communities, recycling programs do not pay for themselves. They're environmentally the, the right thing to do, and that's why a lot of communities have them, even though they cost money to actually operate. Uh, we've been very fortunate in our community because of good participation in the prior investments in the materials recycling facility and participants from uh, even outside our community that contribute that helps keep our costs down. Uh, if we can break even, that is a wonderful thing. What it does, more than anything else, is help with the cost avoidance of the cost at the landfill for tipping fees. That helps keep your uh, overall uh, sanitation rates down. That's why we are well below 
city of uh, Pensacola, for instance. So it, no, it does not make money, but it does help keep sanitation costs down. And lately, it has been breaking even. So. Well, I'm a skeptic by nature, so I'll yeah, be you, looking forward to those. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy papers. to show you financials, and a lot of that's uh, actually available on our website. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll be happy to send that to you. So, so uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Six years ago, and your predecessor come to one of our retiree meetings, and I asked him, y'all had $17 million left over from building that sewer treatment plant. He said, oh, no, we had over $30 million left, $33 million left. Where's that money now? Where's that $33 million in six years? In somebody's pocket, or what happened to right. it? Right. So, and, I'm, and honestly, I'm not familiar that was obviously prior to my administration I will certainly I will certainly research it and get back to you as, as far as that as far as that mention goes and, and please deb into these financials because that's what I do almost probably 10 or 15 hours a week so this was not a one to two day a month gig um, by no stretch of the imagination that's probably has a lot to do with me because I spend a lot of time in it but uh, Mr. Woody you just okay one quick I don't want to leave a lingering question out there uh, that predates me, so I, I wasn't there at the meeting. But I will say I have knowledge from having uh, gone over past uh, uh, information that project came in significantly under budget, and therefore the dollar value of the bonds sold to finance it were uh, correspondingly lower than they would have been. So it's not like there's a pot of money left, left over that we're still retaining. It's just that when we took out the, the mortgage, if you want to call that, uh, on the facility, it was correspondingly lower as a result. And so I plan on staying after um, Commissioner Barry speaks to answer any additional questions that you all have. I just don't want to take any more time for him. Like I said, I, I uh, appreciate you all coming. And, and uh, like I said, I plan on staying, as I always have, very engaged um, with my district. So thank you so much. God bless. Thank you, Kevin. Um, <laughs> I tell you, they never go exactly like you think. So that's the one sure thing about the town halls. They never go exactly like you think. Um, Michelle Salzman, the state representative from District 1, which, <clears throat> excuse me, District 1 is going to encompass um, more or less the north half of Escambia County, and uh, she did make it. Michelle, thank you for being here, and uh, you're welcome to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about your first session. First, I want to call a ceasefire. Ceasefire, ceasefire. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm day late and a dollar short. I'm sorry I showed up late. I am not a dollar short, though. I have a summary in the back. Um, my incredible district secretary, Debbie's got a, a stack of these handouts. If you're interested in what uh, Representative Salzman did during session, it, it highlights almost everything that I personally touched, as well as some other things. Um, I brought home almost $4 million to the district. I said I wanted to do a few Few things whenever I knocked on y'all's doors and sent y'all mailers. One was um, I wanted to focus on safety, infrastructure, and education. And the second thing was I promised you I'd bring you your tax dollars home. I said I'd fight for every penny. If I come home with a dollar, I brought home more than we've gotten back in almost a decade. So here we are. Um, I won't take up a lot of your time because I do have this handout. I am also going to be here after the meeting, but I, I'm going to keep an eye. I'm, I, I think Kevin might be running out the side door or something. I'm just kidding. <laughs> when we campaigned, we, had, we would be out there in front of those um, places, and it'd be Michelle Salzman, Kevin Stevens, Kevin Stevens and Stephen Berry, and we had this fun little sign, Salisbury Stevens, we were running around. So um, I actually have a special place in my heart for these gentlemen up here. They, they do work real hard for y'all. But I will take a couple of questions if you have any. Um, I don't want, really don't want to waste your time if I have these handouts, um, but I'd rather hear from you. My cell phone number is 850-207-5024. Um, you can call me anytime. I answer my phone. You can email me at the state email address. I check all of my own emails. You can also fill out the survey that I've had live since I was running. It's called D1, the number one, matters.com. And I get um, responses daily. It, it gives you an opportunity to tell me what you think is important. I did use those survey results um, a, as a way to uh, maneuver how I voted in Tallahassee and what I fought for in Tallahassee outside of my own priorities. I felt like I was there to serve you. So I try to keep a, a good finger on the pulse. So does anybody have any questions um, of me? Yes, ma'am. 
kind of have a general question. Online, we dialogued a little bit about impact fees, something that I was against that bill, and you made the comment that we had already decided to vote f to support this. And so I wanted to know who's we that mm -hmm. um, decides together for you to support it, and also are there any bills that you voted for that the leadership made you vote for, or were they all voted because you thought they were good bills? Okay, so I'll answer the last part first because that's the easiest one. No. They were very adamant that they wanted us to vote the way we wanted to vote. Um, that I, there were a couple of things that I was on the fence on that, that if I wasn't on a team of folks, I probably would have voted the other way, not because I didn't like a majority of the bill, but because I didn't like little pieces of it. And we all wanted our way, right? Um, but no, they, they absolutely did not. Uh, I'm really excited that I'm on this team that we have currently because they are true conservatives and they've done a great job taking care of every district in the community. And they actually listened to me. One of my priorities was infrastructure. And as you guys know, the safe walkways bill was something really important to me. Something that has not been heard in a committee in over 10 years, it hasn't, it's been brought every year and it's not even been picked up. Nobody would even listen to the conversation about it. And because it was so important to our district, they decided to figure out what, what is this big thing? Why is Representative Salzman so excited about this? Why is she so passionate about it? And at the end of the day, the speaker is funding out of his own budget the study since it didn't make it through on the Senate side. So I would say that we're really fortunate to have leadership in Tallahassee that's really looking after their people. As far as that question goes, um, I answer questions dozens daily, if not a hundred some days. Um, and I'll tell you, I, I think I remember this conversation, but I'll tell you how it works. It doesn't matter what we're voting on. We don't go to the committee meeting and not know what the bill is in front of us. If I went as your state representative to a committee meeting to vote on something and I didn't have my research done and I didn't kind of know where I was going to be at, you would tell me I'm not doing my job as a state representative to go research what I'm about to vote on. So when we have things put on agenda in the committees that we sit in, we are supposed to learn about that bill well in advance go to the bill sponsor and say, excuse me, I like this, I don't like this, here's what we want, what we don't want. We go to the committee chair if we have issues with the bill and we say, we have an issue with this bill. For instance, the port bill. I don't like this for my community and this is why we gotta fix it. So by the time people come to you and the meeting is two hours before or we just voted it on at committee, we have already had those conversations as, as a group, whether it's that committee or the big committee. We've already discussed it as peer to peer. And so waiting until the day of typically is too late to change the mind of someone who has already done the research. It doesn't mean that you couldn't. If it was something that was really egregious that I completely missed and, and I mean, it's possible, then yeah, it could. But if it's something that we've already discussed and made our decision on, then that's the way it is. Imagine if you were on my team, we were in a, a, a board meeting and we all said, you know what, we believe this is the right thing to do. And then we go out and then we come back a day later and then I say, I don't like it, I changed my mind. Would you want to work with me anymore after I told you I was going to do it and then I come back and I say, unless I have a really egregious reason to change my mind, I shouldn't be changing my mind. So I'm not saying that you don't change your mind, but I am saying you come to those meetings prepared. If the, if the bill is on agenda, you've already researched the bill if you're doing the right thing. So it's not that we can't, but in that situation, I believe I remember that situation. It was like the night before or the morning of or, or somewhere right in that area, and we had already had our conversations and decided we were going to vote for that bill. And we do that um, if we're being, you know, proactive in the process. Any other questions? Get, let me get Sean, and I'll come back to you. I'm, 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 I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I have. I have talked to you know what? I'm so glad you asked. Good. Carter and I have been messaging all day today. I got a, a thorough email 
um, I'm, I'm not going to try to pull it up for time reasons, from somebody that had very specific questions about some exit and, and some side roads people are using and the traffic lights. And, and I took that email and I sent it straight to DOT and I said, help. <laughs> and they said, typically we don't get engaged. It, it goes to the county and the county works on the timing of that stuff. Um, but he took it. I emailed the person back and said, DOT is on top of it. I just want you to know. And typically you would run. I told them to say, kind of just said, this is what we do. So yes, I did. We are doing a follow-up meeting to discuss very in-depth Pine Forest and Nine Mile. I promise y'all. I, look, hold me to it. I'm telling you, I, I am on it as, as much as I can be. You have to understand what I did. I was in session. I come back. And during all of that, I was really trying to take my foot off the gas because of the three mile bridge, you know. And so now that the bridge is open, we're in. And he knows it. DOT knows it. They know my secretary is back there. She'll tell you we, we've already been in touch. We're we are working on that. I would love to try to figure out, at least give you guys answers. I don't have a magic wand. I'm not magical, but I promise you, I, I am meeting with them. I've already started that process and fixing some of the issues that were sent to me, and I'm happy to share that off offline so we don't take up time. But yes, Thank you very yes, much. I'm trying. Thank you very, very much. I'm trying. I'm yes. <laughs> me too. I. Me too. Uh, Stephen Barry and I had conversations before session about Quintet Bridge, and we will follow up on that as well. That's something that we'll have to do together. A bridge, and I also, by the way, talked to DOT about the bridge, because a bridge, no matter what bridge it is, it's a federal conversation that you have to have, like, partnership. So we have already actually had the conversation a couple of times. Um, we know that we want to put it in the five-year plan. You know, so, and I, I know what that means, guys. Just take a breath. <laughs> but, but yeah, I know, I know. But we have actually discussed that. That is on um, the priority list of everybody involved. Excellent. Absolutely. I'm sorry, Jamie. I know. Yeah, I know. And, and, I'm going to be honest with you. Thank you for that question because it, it really is a critical question if you really want to be an engaged citizen. It's like I had a lot of my friends that would text me and say, I'm coming to Tallahassee to go speak on the bill tomorrow in your committee, and I'm voting no or yes, the opposite of what they were, you know. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I wish I would have known sooner. I would have brought you in and had you share your word with my sponsor of the bill over here, you know, because that's my job. That's, when people ask me, what are you most proud of in Tallahassee, I say, I answered the phone when people needed help, and I really fought the bills that would hurt Pensacola as much as I could. I'm not there to make a bunch of new laws. I mean, you know, laws are great and all, but at the end of the day, it's really about protecting the people and protecting Pensacola, and I, and I worked really hard to do that. So there were some times when people would show up for public forum, and I'm like, oh, that's really, I mean, it gets you on record. It is important, and it has changed the minds in the past. I don't, I, when I asked, because this was something I wanted to know, I'm like, well, how do you even impact a bill? When was the last Last time a bill died in a committee, it was years ago. All the bills that are presented in committee were already vetted by all of the members, before, you know, at some point, the leadership at some point to say, is this a bill that matches our agenda as, you know, as a majority, whoever the majority is, thank goodness it's the Republicans right now. So, um, so in that case, I did ask, and they said it had been a very, very, very long time. Um, matter of fact, there were a couple of times when a bill w would have failed with the votes that were in line, and other people took, they did their own thing, Democrats did, voted in the way of a Republican so that the bill would continue to move forward, even though when that happens, they kill it, they won't bring it to the next committee because they don't want, they don't want to embarrass anybody, and they certainly don't want to waste taxpayer dollars. If we don't want to pass that bill, they're not going to make us pass that bill, and so that's, there, that goes to the saying, again, of where they really don't make you vote on something you don't want. So how do you do that? I thought it was so bizarre when I first got to Tallahassee. I was getting emails about bills I hadn't even heard of. People were going into um, the system, and they were looking at the bills that were filed in bill drafting. And they would, you search keywords for whatever it is, and you say, okay, this bill's in drafting. It and then, then I start, you know, the influx comes. Don't let this come through. And, and I thought, why are they? And I would take the call, because I, I will always take your call. I'm like, why are these people calling me? I don't even know. But sure enough, that's why. So 
you have to be on the lookout before, before session starts. So session starts in January. You want to be looking at the bills that are coming through whenever um, committee weeks start in September. And session doesn't always start in January, so please don't in three years go to look at it and it's not in January. This year's session starts in January, but committee weeks start in September. So you just start looking at the bills that are being filed and you kind of look for keywords. It's, it's, it's tough. I, and I know, I, rem I remember when we were interacting, you said, how in the world, I, I remember this because I thought you're absolutely right. How in the world can an average citizen who's actually a taxpayer that goes to work, that has children, da da da, you know, all these things that I'm keeping up with, I can't even keep up with the county, much less all of what you're doing, and you're absolutely right. I don't even know. I don't know. It was hard for me as a legislator to keep up with bills and other committees that I wasn't even having to vet because I probably wasn't going to have to vote on it until it got to the floor. And it got even harder as a session progressed and we were bringing bills to the floor. So now I'm having to pre-read bills that are coming to the floor as well as bills that are still coming into my committee. So it, it is, it, you're, you're absolutely right. The answer is I really, I, I think if you have a group of you guys um, and you know in a community, maybe you have certain people looking out for certain things and others looking out for other things, and then, of course, lean on your, your state representative. Look at our committees. The committees that we're in are going to be kind of the bills that we see. Um, the you know, so Andrade is a 90% education committee, so if you're looking for anything education, you know, just call Representative Andrade. If you're looking for anything justice or health care, you can, you know, call me for the most part. I have also have local bills um, and veterans, veterans uh, bills as well. So... That's, I know that was a long answer, but I really hate, I hate that I can't say there's a magic way to do that, but um, just keeping an eye on it as soon as committee week start. We're allowed to start filing bills in a few weeks. So you could, I mean, theoretically you could start looking now, you know, because you have nothing else to do, right? No kids, no grandkids, sorry. Um, any other questions? I'll, I'll take any. Yes, hey. How you doing, Michelle? Super fantastic. <laughs> um, can you... Talk to us a little bit about the uh, six hundred and forty million dollar flood legislation that DeSantis signed into office in, in May, and um, how the county here can bring some of that money here instead of going to South Fl instead of that money going to South Florida. So we we did a huge change, a huge shift in things this year. Um, you know, you have those trust funds and things like that where they pile all that money in and you, you sit on it for decades and then three decades, four decades go by and that's not your priority anymore as a state. You look at it and you go, well, I mean, this is important, but we really need to fix our flood water issue. We have our flood mitigation. And so um, they did, they reevaluated, they changed some things over. The Sadowski Trust Fund was moved a little bit. It was very controversial, but I supported it from the get-go just because I don't believe we should do something because we've always done it. I think we should do it because it's the right thing to do. And I feel like it's the right thing to do for Florida because we do have, you know, the Everglades. We have a lot of wetlands. We have a big issue there. So how do we get money back to Pensacola? Well, you have folks like me that go over there and say, I want the money. Give it to me, you know. But you also, it's not just about that. The cool thing about it, we got money for Century. Thank you to your commissioner, Stephen Berry. I would not have been able to do it without him. I can assure you that was huge on him. But... You, when you go over there to Tallahassee, you don't say, well, I think this is a good idea. I mean, that works sometimes if you're lucky, but how about I went over there and I said, my county commissioner said that, the, said that he supports this. He got all the other commissioners on board. The Northwest Florida Water um, Authority said that they're on board. ECUA said they're on board, and Century said they need it. You know, and I did all that, and then I said, now give me a million dollars. And we got half a million. We, we did some some finagling it. We got a half a million dollars for Century, and I would not have even gotten a dollar had I not gotten went to all of the people involved and really had a collaborative conversation to make sure we were all wanting to be in that direction. So we get that money by just doing that. So that flood water money, we'll get more of it. We're going to continue to work on that. Um, we'll file the same appropriations that we didn't get last year, the 1.4 million. We'll file that again and maybe something else for Century. Maybe even something for ECUA for um, other parts of the community. The idea is you're absolutely right, and we got to get it while it's hot. I was at the ECUA board meeting. Uh, was it last week? I don't know. I, 
I'm in so many meetings. Um, thank you. It was this week. <laughs> and, and, they, and I went up there. They were kind enough to let me speak. But the idea was, I said, look, let me know what we need to do. I'm here. My job as a state representative, I feel, and you can always fire me, is to just whatever you guys want as a whole, I go get it. So I'm not an expert in most of this stuff, but I am certainly an expert at connecting the dots. And so I hope, and we will continue to fight for that. And right now we have leadership that is very concerned about our water. So it's now's the time. And that's what I told them. Let's do it now. Let's get it while it's hot. We need that money. Let's take what we can. So I plan to go back to Tallahassee and fight for more money. And we're in a good position. We've got J.R. Williamson, who is the um, TED approps. We've got um, Senator Broxson is incoming as the overall approps for um, the Senate, which that is huge, guys. That means in a couple of years we should have the floodgates open. I'm going to hold them to it. <laughs> and, then, um, and then, of course, you've got some good fighters in the legislature. So that's how you do it. And we are doing that. We, we brought some back this time, and we will continue to do so. Any other questions? I know this is... Yes, sir. The answer is no, Larry. I'll wrestle you for it. I'm ready. Okay. All right. I know there was a bill that went through that uh, was through the DBPR and the Boxing Commission, which removed from Chapter 548 the requirement for gloves on the fist. Uh -huh. Therefore, giving us bare knuckles in the state of Florida. Oh, okay. I'm hoping you voted on that. Okay, I don't, I haven't, did it go to the floor? I don't recall that bill at all. Yep, it already went through. Well, I, I, well if it went to the floor, I voted yes. Perfect. But I can, do you know the bill number? Uh, I can get it on this phone when I stop recording. I just, I, are you, was it an over, was it a, embedded into another bill? Because I didn't yes. vote on a boxing bill. It, it was, <laughs> it was embedded into another bill. Although I bill. like, look, I'll, I'll wrestle you. I don't know if I'll box you though, because I don't want to lose any teeth. But what, um, anyways, it was a good thing. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm glad y'all did it. It was embedded in another I'm going to take credit. That was my idea. I sponsored it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Well, that's great. Okay, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's really going to open up a lot. Uh, okay. I, I don't know if you've seen on my social media that we had Jorge Masvidal at, at our farm with the uh, bare knuckles fights. But I was, was there. It, Front were ring. You, were you there? Totally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using that. <laughs> <laughs> when no, they I, come for me. <laughs> no, but I actually, I, I fully support that sport. I, I think we've had that conversation before. Yeah, and yeah, that, I didn't yeah. know that was in a bill that I had, but see, it I was, told you, see how they do that? Mm -hmm. They yeah, just it, snuck that one in there. Good thing we're a majority. They did. Hey, the, one other thing too, I hear this from every politician, bureaucrat, everybody, across the board, city, county, state, federal, uh, they always say, you know, we're doing all this, but we're not there yet. Huh. I, well, will, I can tell you what I said. Will we ever be there? Well, I can tell you what I said to the senator a couple of days ago. I said, I said Doug, I, I got everything I asked for. I don't know what to do now. <laughs> I wanted safe walkways. They're doing the study. I wanted money for the bluffs and, and water quality. They gave me that. Um, and then I passed that cottage food bill. And then, of course, we did a lot of good stuff for Pensacola. I had to reevaluate, and I'm still reevaluating what I'm going to do. I know that our study for the water authority, the special water districts, comes back in September, which will dictate whether or not I'm filing a local bill for ECUA or a state bill for ECUA. That is an ongoing thing. I don't, I didn't, even when I filed the first one, I didn't think I was going to be done. But overall, I, I feel like Pensacola was so blessed for that, and, and I am just so grateful we brought money back and we got some good stuff going off the road, and I built a lot of relationships some bridges and I'm there and I'm ready to go next level so I, I, I'm taking suggestions yes sir easy one for you state parks improve the state parks get them cleaned up quicker after Hurricane Sally we my family and several other families in Escambia County constantly went over to Gulf State Park in Alabama that is like a five-star park mm -hmm. Escambia County has to achieve that. That has to be the goal. Tarkland Bayou Park is awesome, but there's so much room for improvement to get it from a two-star to a five-star. Right. Same thing with Big Lagoon. This side of the county, District 5, needs a great park like that as yes, well. Yes, we do, don't we? Don't we? See, I love him. 
And yes, I, we do. I, and I'm sure that Stephen Barry has the check ready right now. No, 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 no. It's a partnership. I think that we work together on that. I, w I would never do that to you, Stephen. Um, but you, we do. And if anything, you should say, Stephen and I actually talked about that uh, about a year ago as well. You know, how do we do that? What about parks in our, in our district? We need stuff in our district. I, it started out as a conversation where I wanted to do a monument in our district. Fun fact. And I wanted to name a bridge. There was all these things I wanted to do. As a state rep, you can do all this fun stuff. And it, and it just boiled down to where would you even put a monument? Where would you even put a, a placard about our fallen soldiers in our community? We don't have a place to do that. So how do you, how do you find that place or build that place or improve that place? So we, it's, I think that's something that would take a long time. We're also talking about a community center and cantonment. There's all, th there's all kinds of conversations going on, which means that it's not falling on deaf ears, but I don't have a plan in place. It, it is something on the, on the radar, though. Anything else? I'm so sorry, Stephen. Yes, sir. having to discuss it, but when you brought up Century, I've been living up here forever with the mismanagement, mm -hmm. funds going missing, mm -hmm. things that should not be happening. Why are they still a city and not absorbed back into the county where things can be brought back to right? Yes, sir. So just want to caveat, the money that we got them from the state and any money that we do get does not go directly to them. It will go through the county and Thank you. That's one of the things I said. It was definitely his, his work that got us there because the state would have never given them a dollar. True story. They've seen what happens, and they said, you know, they want to help Century. I want to help Century. I feel like our, my weakest part of my community is, is just as strong as my strongest. So we have a lot of work in a lot of parts of my, my district that, that I wanted to focus on, and Century was one of them, and, and Commissioner Barry was kind enough to say, we'll manage the money, we'll manage the project, and, you know, we'll get it through the finish line. So that's number one. Number two, I had the conversation with Jimmy Petronas. He's the state CFO, but he also was with with uh, Public Service Commission and other great jobs before that about Century specifically and what does it look like to change us, you know, change them back and, you know, move them back into the county. And uh, he gave me some advice and I think that I'll hold on to that forever. Anything like that should come through a ballot driven thing. I want to see petitions from the community that say that they want me to do that because it'd be me coming in there telling them what they need to do. And it's like me coming in here telling y'all what y'all want me to do in Tallahassee. I really don't want to do that. I would support it if the community supported it. Does that make sense? Okay. Anything else? I'm going to be here. Yes, sir. Just real quick. First of all, I'm all for monuments for fallen soldiers, but private funds can, yes. can handle that. Okay. Um, just an educational question for me so you can help me understand D1, how you work. Sure. What impact and influence do you have, or does D1 representative have, on infrastructure and things of that, basic necessities within D1, as far as roads and things of that nature? That can help uh, you I think that's a good question. I think that's relative. We'll ask Commissioner Barry what impact I have. Help me keep <laughs> Um, well, the way it's supposed to work is the state representative is supposed to oversee state roads and the federal is overseen by your U.S. representative, which is Congressman Gates, and then your local county roads are overseen by your county. So, but you have to have a partnership and collaboration and sometimes you share money and projects. Um, and then, of course, they do have the five-year plan and this big group of folks that come together and create that five-year plan. And those are the ones that really dictate a majority of the money in the community. My power, my individual sole power that I get is these things called appropriations projects where I can go to Tallahassee and say, I need this money for these roads like I did in the Bluffs project. I want two and a half million dollars and I want it now. And even though DOT has promised to put it on the five-year plan for like a million years, it hasn't made it on the plane yet. So my community said, you know, the leaders in the community that I listen to, because I'm the conduit, said, Michelle, they have been telling us this for years. We really need you to get this money. So I file it. And now I get the money. So now I, I've actually appropriated the dollars. Now they're going to come in a nice big fat check, right? Do we get a big fat check or a little check? Big fat check. Electronic, there you go. It, com it comes electronically, and then we can run the project. But I want to share, since you asked, I'm going to share you guys a little piece of information why appropriations are not really liked by the big um, people like DOT and Department of Education and others, because whenever I fund that project in the, in the legislature, that means that I just took $2.5 million out of the top of their five-year plan 
and it's mine now. So now they have to reevaluate their, you know what I mean? So that's the kind of the power, but just to give you a full circle so you understand why a lot of times DOT and others don't really want you to do those five-year plans those, or those appropriations things. But those should be used for projects in which you don't want to wait five years for, and I think that's what we, what we did and what we'll continue to do. I hope that helps you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you guys. I'll stay after, too. Thank you, Commissioner Barry. Super. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Kevin, both for, uh, for, first of all, attending, as well as speaking, and then fielding, fielding questions uh, from constituents. And, and you know, feel free as, as we move forward, if you, you know, if you continue to have a question for, uh, for Kevin or for Michelle, um, you know, please feel free to ask. And uh, we'll kind of open it up for the more broad, for the more broad questions. I, I, because one was a little bit addressed to me, Century. Um, that is something, if they were to ever look at unincorporating, that, that needs to be an initiative from that town, um, from, their, you know, from their constituents as well as their elected officials. That's not, that's not been their intent. That's never been my conversations with them. Um, it's, uh, it's not something that I want to see happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. They have a lot of history. They have, uh, you know, they have the ability to be successful. I want them to be successful. Uh, Senator Broxson uh, helped negotiate uh, during this past, uh, you know, quite a bit. I think helped the town negotiate some higher rates, some more market rates with the uh, Century Correctional Institution, where they provide a lot of utility services, specifically gas, to the facility. That changes, uh, you know, believe it or not, that one institution and some more marketable rates changes their financial picture on an annual basis, uh, makes them a lot healthier. Um, I believe all of us have a good relationship with uh, Ben Boutwell, who's the mayor of the town now, and I think Ben is going to do as good a job as can possibly happen up there. He, he loves the town. He's from there. He moved back there to, um, to settle and retire and uh, put his own money back into the town to want to, to wanna be there to make it home, and I think he's going to do as good a job as can be done up there, So I, uh, and I know he's a friend of all of ours and does the best job that he can, um, and we'll open it up for our, for our questions now, and I'll do the best I can. If I don't know the answer, I'll try to get somebody that knows more than I do. Cliff, sure. Well, I Steve, I, you and I spoke earlier. Sure. We're, let's talk about across from your house on Willowbrook Lake. Okay. We county dropped a million and a half dollars to fix that dam and get it all fixed up. And in the first big storm, what happened to it? Poor engineer and poor design. It washed the dang burn thing away. Yeah. But where I'm getting back. And this is part of Wes Marino needs it, and, and Michelle needs it. This is something going to get laid in your lap. How was it paid for? So how was how, who paid for that dam? So local option sales tax is what paid for the project. Okay. Yeah, that's the problem. That's the thing. And was well, it, well, well, was it? Cliff, please talk to me. Thank that, you. That Willowbrook Lake right. was private. My neighborhood y'all quoted is private and you've told me how many times and i have kevin white and i had wilson robertson and i had janice gilly i've dealt with them i've been dealing this over 25 years yes sir. you don't get services i'm paying for it i'm paying for it and if i'm paying for something and you've got a rule saying you don't have to service me there's a law that says you can't steal and the county is stealing by playing this little game and it's the four com other commissioners the administrator and the attorney and and I, and I am intimately familiar with your situation and it and now, it's well, yeah. and it's private but you're telling everybody else especially in this room that has yeah. to do with y'all make it private you don't qualify you don't get crap but i'm gonna fix this so now, we got a problem yeah. no you're fixing to have a problem so where the work was done at willowbrook which i you know i grew up on kingsfield road where my mom still lives you know well, I'm saying, but I, I've, I've lived there for 45 years, so much longer than I've lived off Kim Strand. Okay. So, I grew up, yes, sir. So, I grew up on Kingsfield, about a half a mile west of the Tom Thumb at Kim Strand in Kingsfield, where my mom still lives. And then we live off Kim Strand, uh, you know, a little bit down from the dam. So, uh, where the money, where the local option sales tax money was spent, was within the county right away, as well as an easement, a permanent easement that we were given by the two lake owners that are on the eastern end of the lake. Um, that, that's. Excuse my I don't give a damn what they did. I, okay, if they did, you know what you know about it. 
I under So your neighborhood, so your neighborhood was the first one where the county instituted a, a plan that I asked them to do to have uh, public money spent in an area that's private infrastructure. And at, at some, I understand Cliff, at some point in time there was a line in the sand that was drawn, this, this infrastructure is public, this infrastructure is private. Um, I, late 90s, Wes, do you remember? Late 90s, maybe 2000, 2001, in that time frame, there was a line in the sand drawn saying, this is private, this is public. Who, who said it was private? The board passed a resolution with a laundry list of, Cliff, I mean, it, well, and, and you, candidly, you and unfortunately thousands of other residents that I have that were, their roads were not included in that list that are publicly maintained. And over the last 20 years, there is quite a divergence in what's public and what's private. Because the private, the private infrastructure, it is so expensive to do roads and drainage and stuff, you just don't see it maintained. And Last question, Cliff. Cliff, it's the last question I'm going to answer. So, obviously, there's been a lot done with local option sales tax. It can only be put in place, <clears throat> excuse me, for a certain period of time, and then it has to be re the initiative has to be repassed by the voters. So, and one of the reasons is to make sure that the government is spending it the way that the citizens want. So, it takes <clears throat> it takes every 10 years to be repassed. So we're on local option sales tax four, meaning we're 30 to 33 years into local option sales tax being collected. Um, but specifically, I'm gonna answer your question about Willowbrook. Everywhere where money was spent on Willowbrook is a current permanent county interest. There are, there are resources, there are assets. What happens <clears throat> after the flood of 14, Kimstrand Road was out. Kimstrand Road was uh, not passable for a long period of time. Um, I live on the other side of Kings, Kim Strand Road. Cliff, 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 I'm, I'm answering your last question, okay. So Kim Strand Road was out. <clears throat> I'm, Cliff. Cliff, I live there. Kim Strand Road was impassable for a, for a period of time. And so, so what's going to happen? I live on the other side. Of, I live south of that spot, so it didn't affect my commute. But... There are issues with where that water goes. That water then goes under Kim Strand. <clears throat> Ideally works its way through Clear Creek, south, I'm sorry, east, further east. Then it kind of turns to the north, ends up in, uh, ends up in Escambia River. A tremendous flooding down river from that lake as well. That dam is now, it's, you know, unfortunately after the hurricane, we only had about three months of the dam being constructed and functioning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then we had the hurricane. It's taken us a long time to get these NR, natural res, uh, NRCS projects back through, uh, back through the timeline. So we finally have Willowbrook. It's currently in design. We've got the construction bids that we're expecting to go out in July. So within the next few months, we will get it. We will get it reconstructed. And you know, thank goodness we're going to be able to use some NRCS dollars for that reconstruction. And I understand that's not something that makes you happy. I appreciate you being here and your relative civility. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Cliff. All right. Yes, sir. I brought my 13 year old son to show how a local government works. So, sure. Uh, straighten well, up. Here. Welcome. <laughs> uh, question uh, We'll talk after about per, little, uh, small things, but. Uh, um, 
these, the bluffs I keep hearing about and the feasibility studies and so forth, I've watched uh, Greenbrier Road, which you're very familiar yes. with, uh, the, just millions and millions of dollars in feasibility studies thrown down rat holes and one environmental impact study, you know, breeding of a snail darter shuts the whole project down. The bluffs is, you know what's gonna happen to the bluffs. It's, I mean, the frustration of, you know, reality bears its ugly head. Uh, UWF is still waiting for a back entrance to be cut through on Greenbrier Road. Is that dead on the vine? I don't know that I would say UWF is waiting for that <clears throat> because, well, you know, candidly, so I, I have been in office eight and a half years now, and the, uh, you know, the studies related to that haven't moved during that time because there hasn't been, um, there hasn't been the impetus or the, the request, the motivation, whatever you would say from university leadership to try to, uh, to, try to move that forward. If, uh, you know, if we have a change in leadership at the university or, there, or, if, or if they have a change in priorities that says we really need that western entrance you know, through 10 Mile or Greenbrier in that section, then, you know, then that probably changes the conversation with the county. Um, uh, it's, it's currently there's, there's nothing in process related to that, western, to that western entrance. And the Bluffs Project, candidly, from the very beginning, that's a 20-year project. It, it, you're talking about 3,500, 4,000 acres being developed for industrial use. Um, that area has a lot of assets. They have, and I'm not an engineer, but they have whatever you would call the highest grade uh, gas main that runs through there. You have whatever you call the highest grade rail that runs through there. You've got a couple of Army Corps maintained ports that are on the river in that, in that vicinity. Um, obviously, ECUA is a big partner in the Bluffs Project. It's four landowners that make up, you know, the 3,000 acres. <clears throat> we knew that that was going to be a long-term project to have anything. There's a, candidly, there's a bridge between, it runs on the north end, Bex Lake Road, which is the eastern side of Muskogee, down to Old Kim Strand. Um, it would take a bridge to connect that completely um, in the middle. That's a very expensive endeavor. So. What we're trying to do is trying to attract uh, tenants or businesses <clears throat> either on the north end coming south off of Bex Lake, relatively close to Bex Lake, or on the south end from the old Kim Strand side moving kind of northward from there. It's, it's, it would, ideally it would be heavy industry industrial development. It would be, you know, companies like whether, you know, International Paper, Armstrong, it would be heavy industry, that type of, uh, th those type of industries that you really don't have another place in this current environment where you can, where you can put them. You know, we've got the 600 acres or 550 acres uh, that are outlined field eight directly west of Navy Federal on Nine Mile Road. If we had, if we had somebody that wanted to come in and put, you know, they needed 100 acres for some type of, you know, some type of chemical development of some sort or an ascend or somebody, that can't go there. I mean, that's not uh, that's not going to fit in that. That's not going to fit in that community. It's certainly not going to fit as a neighbor to Navy Federal. Um, so this is potentially what can be what can be there. The two and a half million dollars that Representative Salzman was uh, successful, not just in getting appropriated. Um, you know, candidly, we were uh, successful in getting some appropriations previously. Uh, we got a lot of help from Senator Brocks and got a lot of help candidly from Jerry Williamson. But um, it got vetoed out of the, uh, you know, we got line item vetoed out of the governor's office. Um, so it takes getting it through the legislature, and then it also takes the political, political capital to be able to keep it in the budget once it hits the governor's office. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. So the two and a half million specifically. This specific appropriation is going to be for transportation improvements entering Ascend. It is a huge ask from Ascend. Um, I don't know if everybody's really familiar with what they're doing out there. I know we have some employees in the audience or former employees. No, it's, 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 the, same, it's the same directional entrance, but it's just improving it to, the, to what they want. Um, they're moving the pellets that they produce out there and I'm not a chemist either, but you know they produce these these plastic pellets. They can 
chemically make them where they withstand high rates of heat, very low, you know, very low temperatures, make Kevlar bulletproof this. I mean, all types of plastic goes into all kinds of things. They're shipping those, uh, those pellets out for customers 24-7. I mean, they're doing, a, they're, they're moving a tremendous amount of product. Uh, part of why I hope that we were successful keeping that, that two and a half million in this year, the county just resurfaced Old Kim Strand Road from Highway 29 to the entrance to Ascend. Then, uh, like I said, we were more successful keeping that money. So that's going to, hopefully, the thought is, uh, facilitate more business and more job growth at Ascend with that improvement. Um, the county has not put any county funds towards the Bluffs development. It's not the type of thing that we could successfully do, candidly. It, it's, it's just, it's too big a project. Um, uh, you know, we, we spent five years working to get the D transfer done for Outline Field 8 next to Navy Federal. And, you know, candidly, that was a struggle for a while just to get that done, and that was $15, $16 million. We couldn't put a, that's a fraction of what the long-term development of the bluffs would cost. So we're going to have to be able to bring in some employers on either that north end or south end to show some feasible, uh, to show some success there, to be able to continue garnering help out of the state. But we're five or six years into, uh, uh, into some annual appropriations to try to continue moving forward with that. Long term, it's, it's game changing. I was, like I said at the very beginning of the meeting, I was very excited to talk about 150, 200 jobs going into the Central Commerce Park, hopefully. And the long term build out of the bluffs could be thousands of jobs. And those, those, types of, uh, those types of jobs, if you have any family members and those that work in some of those industries, you might think about the kind of things when you go into the causeway, into Mobile, where Austin lives, and those kind of, those kind of jobs pay a lot of money and they're very high wages, and it would be something that probably outlives my public service to see it on the ground, but you know, maybe my kids could benefit from it in years. Well, that's, candidly, that's how we ended up in that area. You know, that's how we ended up being buffered by such a, by such a large conglomerate. It's only four owners, but such a large conglomerate of acreage to be able to get off the beaten path, to be able to get out of where we have populated areas and kind of away from the, away from the crowd. Um, uh, you know, candidly, the, the, you know, the water reclamation facility, um, you know, I ran in 2004, uh, you know, unsuccessfully, but at that time there was a, that was during the time that the Main Street relocation project was, was going on and it was such a big topic of discussion. And uh, there was a real concern from District 5 about what impact is that gonna have on District 5? You know, I live very close to where the plant was going to go. If you don't go there, you don't, you don't realize the plant's even there. Um, so a lot of those fears were, were set aside by the reality of what happened, and I'm hoping long-term the Bluffs development would be, the, would be a similar type out, outcome. Yeah. Whoever else? Yeah. Uh, thank you to the directors for being here, but specifically Mr. Gilmore um, and for what you're doing in public safety. I do have two questions, but this gentleman right here had a question before me. And okay, sure. Okay. You go ahead. When you have a granddaughter, she, she honors age. Yes, sir. <laughs> but uh, Barry, thank you for having the, the town hall meeting. Sure. And uh, inviting the others here. I have a lot of questions, but at the same time... <laughs> The problem that we have on Carlton Road, I think you're very familiar with it. Are you Mr. Lancaster? Yes, I am. Okay. All right. I've talked to you on the phone. I haven't met you in person. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, sir. Forgive me for not introducing Yeah, former myself. commissioner. Thank you. But we have an, a, a real problem, and it's uh, all funneling down to that one area. Yes, sir. And uh, I think if you would get with me, I think we might have a little solution to that. Okay. I failed on the first Inex one. Very so. inexpensive okay. solution to it. Zero, uh, thank you, uh, and candidly, I, I failed on the first one. Um, we had a design, you know, we, and, you know, I had talked with you and, and your wife quite a bit over the years. Um, you know, we had a design. We had, I don't know, a half dozen easements that were needed. We had a couple of people that were willing to sign the easements that did execute those easements for the project. And, um, yes, sir, and I, and I thought, I thought I was going to be able to negotiate an easement from them, and, and it just didn't work out. I met with them a half dozen times, but... If you want to 
want to go that direction, you may have to move just a little bit uh, uh, to the south of okay. those people. Well, and if, uh, yeah. I'm sure he would be happy to uh, work with you. But at the same time, uh, the solution that uh, I'd like to recommend would be fairly simple, is to run down the fence row that we have and not bother the trees that we have there for the birds. My wife loves the birds, and uh, uh, but uh, it could run down to Bruce's property, turn left, or okay. right off to Ashland, and get right into the 11 and, and Bruce is good with it? Pardon? Mr. Biles is good with it? I haven't talked to okay. him about right. it, but I needed to talk to you first. Okay, sure. Because I know that y'all talked to him about getting additional Okay. And uh, we didn't know anything about that. And, uh, but I, I won't start with you first. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you, and, and Zero, I'll be happy to follow up with you and, and, and try to and try to find out what your what your idea is. And, and again, I, I I thought I had something, and it just didn't work out. I apologize, but yes, sir. She meets her garbage men out there with two bottles of water for each one of them and some cookies. So. So um, my first question is, um, I know that you have been working on different things for um, the internet and cell phone service out here in District 5, and I know that you know the struggle that we have out here. So um, y'all have been working on different things with the commission, so where are you at with it right now, and what do we have coming with the future that we can look forward to? So we did, the, we did <coughs> excuse me, a broadband feasibility study that, um, you know, that we got the report back. Magellan was the, was the advisor. and. Um, they are working now on the bid documents to go out for a phase one build out of a 10 gig backbone. Um, and I apologize, I, I didn't think necessarily about the technical stuff to ask Bart to come out, but isn't that the phrase, the 10 gig backbone? Okay, yeah, yeah. So it's, um, so we're moving, we're moving forward with it to see, uh, to see about what the first phase, so it would be phase one of a build out of a 10 gig backbone um, uh, to start. The cell phone reception, I, I, certainly, <laughs> I certainly agree with you. I mean, I was, uh, I was on the phone driving out here tonight and, and my cell phone reception dropped again. It's very, very frustrating. Um, I continue to hear that Verizon has got, they've got the, the, the dishes, they've got them coordinated, fixed, and all this. And I, 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 Eric, have you talked to the Verizon people lately? And I only ask, this is not public safety, but Eric, after the hurricane, Eric was kind of my go-to guy about why my cell phone didn't work um, anywhere that I went, including my house on Nine Mile Road. It's, it, it's really frustrating. And we should, the community that we have, we should be much more successful with those type endeavors. Um, so what have they said lately? I know they're putting a new tower in, maybe? They're putting a new tower in. So I'm no cell phone guru by any stretch of imagination, but I know myself uh, up here that I had better service before the hurricane, probably as many as you did as well. Uh, what they informed me was that the microwaves were out of alignment. We didn't lose towers. We didn't lose power. Everything was generated uh, that the microwaves out of, out of alignment. So as I identify those areas that we had better service in before the hurricane, I get with Verizon and I tell those guys, because I have Verizon carriers, so I don't know about AT&T. I tell those guys where we're missing, such as the drop-off right here at 29 at Barth, where it goes down. You know, we lose cell, cell service there. Uh, up towards Century, they never had good cell service to begin with, but I informed them that it's, it's bad out that way. Out toward Walnut Hill and Barth and Verano Park area, in some of those low-lying areas that we had better service before. So I try to identify those areas and bring that to Verizon's attention. They are building a tower. Uh, this is an AT&T tower on Highway 97. Um, it's an AT&T tower that's going up in Century that I'm uh, familiar with at the uh, football field there. Uh, but Verizon is putting a tower up on the west side, uh, somewhere Barano Park, Walnut Hill area. There is supposed to be a tower going up that way as well. Um, AT&T did share with me their first net coverage that they're trying to get better up here to include two to three more tower sites in the next year or so that AT&T is trying to do. But that's the best I can tell you. Uh, but as I identify those areas, I do try to bring that to Verizon's attention because I am a Verizon user, as probably many of you guys are as well. So, But that was the explanation they gave me. So uh, after the storm, uh, please believe me that we try to get that. I do have an ESF2 
uh, group that sits in communications, and as those things come up, and believe me, I heard it from Commissioner Barry that he couldn't get a text message at his house, so then I definitely called Verizon to try to get that rectified. So, thank you. And something that's you know as as important or more important to a lot of the folks out here, um, you know, we've got areas, you know, candidly, <clears throat> Frontier Communications struggled when they were um, active or not in bankruptcy. They've been in bankruptcy for some period of time now, so the thought of them putting any capital into their network is probably not a feasible one or a realistic one. Um, so there was what I think, especially long-term, really good news this past December. Uh, some of the funds that I believe were part of the CARES, part of the CARES legislation, but the FCC, the Federal Communications, uh, did a, an auction, a bid, for Rural Digital Opportunity Fund and what it was, they identified 3,500, 4,000 sites in Escambia County that had no service, literally no service, which that's not hard to find that many. And if you include unser uh, underserved with unserved, you've got more than 10,000. But, you know, they identified at least 3,000 or 3,500 that had no service. And uh, those sites or those locations were put out to bid. Um, Charter Communications, which is the parent company of Spectrum, which, and... Charter Communications is huge. They do have the capital to be able to, to outfit a network. Um, they're a very large publicly traded company. And uh, they won a number of those sites in the, uh, in the unserved area through that rural, rural Digital Opportunity Fund in December last year. And they have uh, a time frame of, I believe, five years to have those sites built out, but they've certainly indicated to me they want to do that in a more speedy manner. And, um, and I'm still trying to as part of the conversation moving forward with the Magellan, the county broadband feasibility study, also maybe we can partner with them since they're going to be getting some federal dollars to be doing some unserved areas in, uh, in the district. If maybe we could publicly, privately partner with them um, to try to do more of a fiber build out to the un underserved areas as well as the unserved areas. So it, I know it's a huge problem. And, when you have kids at home that can't get, they can't do their schoolwork the way that they should be able to, you have so many people working from home, they're disadvantaged greatly by what has become a human right. I mean, it is in the same way you should have access to water and power and those things, you should have access to a, uh, an internet speed at your home that is reasonable to be able to do those, what are now basic things, work, do your school from home, um, those things. It's, you know, about six or eight months ago, the county spent, uh, you know, a decent amount of money, several hundred thousand dollars, putting in Wi-Fi, a very strong Wi-Fi, real uh, internet, real wired internet solution into the community centers and the parks that are in District 5 specifically. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, there was some criticism to that. But what I didn't necessarily give the narrative at the time for was by doing that, by having some fiber sporadically spaced out throughout the district, it's long-term going to make it easier to, if you think about a spider web trying to connect areas of current connectivity, it does make the long-term build-out of those areas more feasible because at least we have some pockets of high-speed internet um, throughout the district now that we didn't have a year ago. Uh, so that's, that, that's a good thing. So I, you know, I struggle with the internet and the cell phone stuff at my house too. And, and candidly, I know it's an issue out here, but I, like I said, I live off 10 mile basically, and it's an issue, it's an issue for me too. Thank you. Um, if you wanna pass this on, I haven't checked it out for myself, but one of my neighbors recently told me, if you contact Verizon and you tell them where you live and you're in a rural area, they will send you to, for your home, a Wi-Fi extender to help you, and I've heard from several people out here that have gotten them, how it works better, but I haven't tried it for myself. But my second question is, um, over the weekend, I learned um, that uh, Nine Mile Road in South is now the poverty line for Escambia County, and you know, in the past 10 years, Escambia County has grown significantly. So the, with the census coming out, and I know it's been delayed because of COVID, where do you see um, the redistricting occurring? Um, so, let's see, for the last 10 years, um, if, you go, if you go back 20 years, the District 5 line ran south to, uh, to the Inslee area, to that Detroit, to 
that Detroit Johnson area that was uh, that was kind of the line the southern line for district five uh, when redistricting was when redistricting was done in 2011 um, that line for most of the district was brought up to nine mile road as the southern boundary uh, there has been there was one precinct left in uh, district five that's south of nine mile road they voted at seventh day adventist church there in university for years then recently they moved to olive baptist church um, so I think it's very reasonable to expect that we, we being Kevin and I and uh, Bill Slayton from the school board, um, that we lose that precinct. I would certainly expect that, and we hadn't talked about it, but that's a very reasonable thing to expect. Um, I don't know that we would lose, even with population shift, um, that's gonna be a pretty heavily populated area. So I don't know if that's gonna do enough to offset the population shift. Um, so it's possible that maybe we lose another precinct that's even north of Nine Mile Road, but I, you know, uh, I, I haven't seen any of, no, well, I say I haven't. No one that I know of has seen any of the numbers yet, but I know that, uh, you know, we do have an expectation to finish that work by the end of December. And uh, so we're gonna just have to, as a board, we have a end of December end date, so then we have to kind of back into well, if we have to finish it by then, then we have to have two me public meetings about it, then we need to do it this, th this at this point. We've gotta have two meetings with the school board, so we need to do this with this. So we're gonna be backing up into where we need to start. Um, I expect the first time that we discuss it, we're gonna to have to start doing some stuff in August, uh, just to, to meet that timeline. So that's the best I can guess, but I would 99.9% .9 sure we lose that Isle of Baptist precinct, for sure. Nice, let's get um, I'm actually speaking on behalf of my sister, sure. yes, as you're sir. aware. She lives adjacent to the Cove Pond. Yes, sir. Brief, well, history, I'll back up. History, not necessarily brief. Uh, 1999, the county approached, I actually owned the property prior to her, and the county approached wanting to buy that property for a holding pond. It was a little over six and a half acres. Really wasn't a desire to sell, um, so I asked, do you really need all six and a half acres. Um, engineering came back, ended up, said actually we can, four and a half acres will do. That's why that pond is an L shaped around her current residence now, is because it said four and a half acres. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, and I know this all took place prior to all y'all's tenure in this seat, but uh, that pond was not at that time designed as a 100 year storm pond, it was a 25 year storm pond. Um, as a developer, I don't get to do that. Somehow y'all do, but I don't get to do that. I just finished a small 23 lot subdivision. My engineering firm contended we didn't even need the pond. Hundred thousand dollars later, I got a massive pond for a little old 23 lot subdivision. You got you've got a good engineering department. <laughs> I got a good engineer too. I'm, I'm but, saying that, that's he's my friend. I know. I know. Uh, right. But nonetheless, so the county purchased that. Y'all are very familiar with the Cove Pond. Um, it continues to be a problem. Y'all know that whole area is a problem. That entire area. In fact, I'll go back years, years ago. Richard Dwayne approached me. I've got some acreage on the other side of the Haji Shrine Temple, and he approached about putting a big holding pond there. That was right before he left. After he left, there was no more discussion. But that pond obviously is inept. I think. I don't think anybody will take issue. I think Rob will attest to that. Anybody, you know. That pond is inept, there's no question about it. Uh, after continued flooding over and over, 2014, she got two and a half feet of water in her home. Um, $70,000 later, she's back in. Uh, she really did, there'd been some discussion um, with, with the county. She really didn't want to sell and didn't. Uh, they, it never really went anywhere. Sally. She, once again, sat right there, watched the pond overflow and come right in her home again. Now, she only got six inches this time, but right. six inches of water in your home again. So all the furniture, two vehicles, you know, it's, uh, it's time. And I've, I've tried to be patient. We've tried to be amicable. We like to be amicable, but it's time. And it, it doesn't just affect her. Now, she's got letters from a number of people in the area that have, repeated flooding incidences and uh, one of her neighbors that's already left the area and attested that she sold because um, her grinder pump flooded, flooded and had to replace it, but uh, which was on her. So 
I know there's been mention of the $640 million. Can we and have we taken any initiative in terms of capturing any of that money? So I, I can't speak to that, that part of it necessarily. That's, I'm sure as a board member, I can tell you, the board would be very interested in that. So that, uh, that would be certainly something the board would support. Um, and I, have, we, have we not investigated what that process is? I don't want to say that, Skip, necessarily. And Joy is not here. If Rob, if Rob has an answer, he, he's certainly welcome to. But Joy is not here. I don't, know that, I don't know that we have or haven't. But I know, again, Joy's out of town. She did mention to me a couple of weeks ago about trying to look at an, a hazard mitigation grant for the property. You know, I am, you know, have been over to your house, Ms. Butler, and I am familiar with what's, with what's gone on there. Um, four and a half acres should be a pretty good pond. That should be, that's a lot of property. We should be able to have a pretty healthy retention pond on that site. Um, there's a pond on Ponderosa that was put in after the 14 flood where, you know, where we did buy a couple of properties and put a pond in. It's only three acres, three and a half acres. But it has no outfall. Well, but my, my point is it functions very well. It, it's on a small, that Ponderosa pond functions very well. I, I office next door to it and am real close to the people that live on either side of it. So I know it functions well. They've not had any, they've not had any, any issues since it was installed or built in 2015, but, or 2016. Um, the so, even that area. Well, but what I'm saying, four and a half acres is a, is a pretty large parcel. We should be able to do more on that property than has been done. Um, previously, I had not, you know, for whatever reason, hadn't gotten a lot of, you know, I'm not an engineer. I mean, you know me well enough to know that. Not gotten a lot of uh, uh, interest in trying to do something with the pond, but... Um, after the discussion that I had with, uh, with Joy Jones about the hazard mitigation grant program, um, and I gave her my feedback, which was, we haven't done anything to the pond yet. That's the first thing, that's what I want to do. We can apply for something coinc you know, coinciding to trying to get a grant, that's okay. But um, when Joy had some folks look at it, which Rob, is that something you looked at or did somebody else specifically? Okay. Alan, oh, with that, okay. So Alan Vincent from HDR apparently is who looked at it. So what we're, uh, what we're looking at is uh, trying to dig it out and dig it down 13 feet and uh, dig the sides out some and get it deeper. That should be a large enough pond to function in that area. Okay. If that's well, approach, that's all I need to know. Does it leave you retired or does it Well, that's going to be the first thing that we're going to. That's going to be the first thing that we're going to try to do because I can do that. I can do that immediately, and including. Yes. That's on the south side of that pond. Yeah, it's nine and a half miles. Sure. Nine and a half. Just off of Cove Avenue, on the south side of the pond. Yes, sir. That house has been flooded four times. They're on nine and a half mile road. Okay. The other pictures are pictures of the pond flooded in Sally, and Sally wasn't that big of a storm. Which, which pond, Bob? Cove Avenue. Cove. Okay. Yeah. And like I said, I I, I don't dispute. Yes, ma'am. I'm not saying the pond is functioning currently. That's, that's not what I'm saying. And um, that needs to happen. I mean, we, we, should have dug, we should have done more work in the pond um, when, you know, the first time that you and I talked about it five years ago. We should have done more in the pond. I was told there was nothing we could do. More recently, I'm told that now there, is some, there are some things that we can do. The HMGP grant process that Joy was, you know, that Joy, I was, kind of Joy's first, um, you know, first wish to go down, that's a long process. And I don't want to wait for something like that. What I want, this is something that we can do relatively quickly, which is get the pond to function as well as it possibly can. 
And then if we have to go down another path as far as acquisition, we can do that. But we can start the HMGP grant now and try to improve the pond now. wanted to be here, but because of a um, uh, medical one. emergency, she was not able to make it. This one. May I read this letter? To whom it may concern, the intent of this letter is to reiterate the damages that occurred to my property located at 3396 Stefani Road and to the address the problem of repeated flooding in my neighborhood. Flo Floodwater damaged my home on three separate occasions, September 1998, March uh, 2014, September 2020. My yard has experienced flooding repeatedly. The continued flooding in the 10 Mile Road, Stefani Road, and Cove Avenue areas create ongoing, ongoing alarms to all the residents. This address experienced flooding from the uh, September 28, 1998, Hurricane George, March 2014, and September 18, 2020, from Hurricane Sally. The types of floods the area is vulnerable to include seasonal weather, climatic weather, hurricanes, severe storms, and flash floods. Flood frequency and severity change the outcome of each flood threat. Due to the disgusting flood drainage, my home has suffered continued damage and has had to be repaired with repeated sheetrock construction and numerous other repairs. Flood with NFIP a 9-18-2020 GCF confirmed by creek overflow into the road and risk. Although property owners have called attention to the problem in the past, the county has been negligent in responding to repeated complaints to permanently fix the flood drainage concerns on the Creek Bridge on Stefani Road. Escambia County needs reminding that the quality of life issues affecting property owners are more important there than their wants. The flooding around my home has steadily worsened since two, September of 1998. Water sprouts up out of the storm drains on high tide and even under clear skies. The, additional, the addition of storm water flooding out of the storm drains at high tide and even when skies are clear. The additional st storm flooding due to poor drainage is a recipe for disaster. There have been an increase in flooding events as well as increase in the depth of the floodwaters. My yard has flooded to the level of three feet on storm water on numerous occasions. Storm water flooding affects my home, streets, ditches, ditches as the water contains uh, potentially de deadly bacteria such as E. coli, garden materials like dirt, sand, mulch, uh, animal urine and feces, herbicides, pesticides, broken glass, ru rusty screws, nails, woods, trash and more. Health concerns aside, I experience reoccurring property damage with flood waters, sidewalks and streets are crumbling. Vehicles are destroyed from the water. Property owners are um, inundated by mold and, in, um, and is causing grass and vegetation to die. As a homeowner, I am expected to bear the financial burden of remedy the damage caused by the failure of the county to rectify this problem. The simple fact of the matter is that our stormwater system is antiquated. We, the taxpayers playing, paying homeowners of Escambia County, have the right to expect and demand that our elected county government stop the 
the uh, frivolous spending of millions of taxpayer dollars and ensure the health and safety of our families, homes, and properties. I'm not the only one that gets this every time it rains, every time a storm comes. And it's ridiculous. And if I have to do, I mean, it's just, it's frightening. When you stand there and you see, you have water in your yard. I'm not saying I didn't, but I didn't flood until it busted out the fence came down the driveway and surrounded my home from the front and the back. I was like a whirlpool. Right. <clears throat> and you've known about this for years. And you have never called me back. Yes, ma'am. I've been to your house a couple of times. Yes, ma'am. But you I, have never spoken yeah. to me. And you okay. told me at the last meeting that I came to that you would call me and that you would have Dawn call me. Well, I still have no, no response. Mrs. Butler, I have spoken to your engineer many, many times about, about the issue, and uh, we are... But that's only when I could not get you. Well, Mrs. Butler, I have spoken to the engineer many times about your, your engineer, not the county engineer. I understand. Okay. Your engineer many times. Skip, I have spoken to Mr. Fitzpatrick on your behalf many times. So... What, what's been the result? I mean, taking... Well, well, I spent $70,000 redoing our house after 2014. Yes, sir. And now, all over again. All over again. How many times are we going to go through? I'm facing another hurricane season. I can't have the system keep going through. So, like I said, in the immediate future, we're going to put the money in to improve the pond. Improve the pond. Four and a half acres should be more successful than what it is. So, Skip, you've never, you've, never been to, you've never been told that by me. No work has been done on that pond in five years. Yes. Well, so the county engineers previously have said it's not going, there's nothing we can do on that pond. There's nothing we can do on that pond. Now they're saying we can go 13 feet deep, we can dig out the sides. Thank you, Chris. And I have spoken to Mrs. Calhoun many times as well. Part of Mrs. Calhoun's issue is different than your issue. Part of Mrs. Calhoun's issue is the bridge that she's referring to. We end up with these beaver, these beaver dams that get there. And it's a real environmentally. You did send somebody out there with a lawnmower. It's the only thing that you've ever sent out there to help her. And she, you cut the, the grass in the ditch and didn't clean it out, left it there, which made it a worse problem. Well, I, I did not know that it ended up being worse. But we're still trying to get the beaver dam issue. The beaver dam at that bridge is what, backs, is what backs the water up both directions, coming from that beaver dam. Apparently, it's not as easy as I would think about going and just you know, clearing out a beaver dam. It's not something you can just do like that. We're having issues getting nuisance wildlife people in there to actually, to actually remediate or move the beavers or relocate them, whatever they have to do with it. And there's a gentleman in between Mrs. Calhoun and the bridge whose yard and house has flooded many times as well. And I've spoken to him. I understand. It's frustrating. The timelines, I understand, are frustrating, Skip. I'm, I'm working. I'm doing the best I can. That's all. I, I have to deal with the county every day. Last thing I want is being in adverse position. I mean, well, you're, you're, I'm you're, mercy yeah. is every day. You're not in one. I'm just, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I understand you being frustrated. I've tried to communicate. Okay. I'm going to war. I, I mean, I, I hate it, but I mean, I can't let her keep going. Through. Okay. Would you want your mother or your loved one that's alone to have to go through this? No, ma'am, and I don't want you to have to go through it either. I, you ago, know I love you, man. I, you know I appreciate it. But six years ago I did this. If I have to do this again in six years, I'll be 80 years old. I am 74 years old. Yes, ma'am. I understand. I don't think you do. Okay. Larry. Sure, Larry. Oh, I'm sorry. I got it, sir. Chris, okay. I got it. I'm Chris Kerb. I worked for the county for 25 years. I'm now, I'm now a technical advisor for Flood Defenders. Um, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization with the goal of helping flood victims 
Flood effective citizens advocate for better flood protection. That's why I'm here. Um, right now we have up to uh, 1,100 residents that have signed up on our Facebook page, uh, Flood Defenders dash Panhandle. Flood Defenders is supporting uh, Darlene, is that right, Darlene Butler? Darlene Butler. I want to say Darlene, but it's Darlene Butler. And Skip Butler, um, after significant flooding in the uh, Cove Avenue and surrounding areas, the homes surrounding the stormwater ponds on Cove Avenue and Ponderosa Drive have flooded repeatedly, including April 2014 and Hurricane Sally. In both cases, these ponds are surrounded by contour drainage bowls. I gave you a map. I've emailed it to you earlier this afternoon. Um, and it shows all the little green contour drainage bowls on it. I am an engineer. I went to Auburn University. got a four-year degree um, from Auburn University. And I can tell you what's going on out here. Water's from a hundred, uh, hundreds of acres around the, the, this area flowing into both of these ponds. Ponderosa Pond does not have a defined positive outfall. Cove Avenue Pond does have a piped outfall. It actually goes down Fowler Avenue Street. There's a drainage system on Nine and a Half Mile Road and Cove Avenue that actually function as an inflow and an outflow pipe. They're, they're connected to the system on Fowler Avenue. Ponderosa Pond was expanded in 2017 by the county but it's, it doesn't have a positive outfall. This means the pond fills up and it has nowhere to go. That's actually a violation of your own land development code when it was expanding Ponderosa Pond uh, without a positive outfall. If you want to look it up, it's under the land development code, chapter one, article one, section one dash 1.2. This was done in spite of concerns raised by county staff to cut costs for that project. The county staff was me, because I worked for you at the time. Okay, is it a question, Chris? Yes, <laughs> okay. I'm giving you the information okay. that you need for okay. this. Okay. The Cove Avenue Pond was designed to handle today's storm event. Uh, it is strained by the overflow from the Ponderosa Pond Drive, a Ponderosa Drive Pond, excuse me. The Cove Avenue Pond was built in 2001 was designed on an out-of-date requirement that of a 25-year design store. That means it can't handle today's storms that we're having 100-year events. That's why your house floods, because it was designed for a 25-year storm. Additionally, when it was originally designed, it was for a six-acre pond. Y'all weren't willing to sell six acres of property. And uh, I think that was around 1999 when y'all sold the property. You only sold 4.3 acres. You can't go deeper with that pond because of water table. I believe that the Ponderosa Pond, when it was expanded, that helped an area, but you still have a problem with what's going on underground and, and, and surface flow in these little green contour bowls that you got that I showed you on that map. Basically what happens is the Ponderosa Pond during storm events creates, creates an additional buff and below, gr below ground flow to the Cove Avenue Pond inflow outflow system, increasing the pressure on the outfall system on Fowler Avenue. So what do you need to do? You need to provide buyouts for the property owners in high risk areas ne next to the pond. There's one owner right over there, his name's Bob Ward. And the owner right here is, uh, you're, you're also an owner next to the Cove Avenue Pond? And there's another one right here, and Darlene Butler. Provide buyouts for those people. Expand the Cove Avenue Pond using, uh, using the newly acquired property and make it the size that it needs to be. You need to connect the Cove Avenue Pond to the Ponderosa Pond with storm pipes to ensure that the entire system has a positive outfall as required by your land development code. This gentleman over here, Skip Butler, he's not allowed to build a pond and turn it over to the county if it doesn't have positive outfall. He's required to keep it private and the homeowners association has to take it over if it doesn't have positive outfall. Is that true, Skip? You got a pond sitting over there right across the street on Cove Avenue because it doesn't have a positive outfall. 
That's also in the same basin. So uh, flood defenders, um, you're going to see me a lot more. This is just one little micro campaign we're running right now, and uh, we're, we're hoping that the county can fund the bigger plan. It's, it was a plan that came out in 2015 after the April 2014 storm event. It's a $417 million plan, and the county right now is only spending $4 million a year on drainage out of local option sales tax. Now, there is a little coming from Restore, um, and there's a few little HMGP grants you get every now and then, but those HMGP, HMGP grants take years. You know, I um, yeah. can't remember the name <clears throat> of the project, but Delano yeah. still haven't even been, hasn't even been awarded the grant for construction. So uh, if you got any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. If you want to meet with me for lunch one day. Um, as far as, um, what was the lady's name over there at uh, Stefani? Nan, Nan, Calhoun. Nan Calhoun. That's actually in the 11 Mile Creek Basin. Uh, this project is in the 8 Mile Creek Basin. Right. You already got studies and solutions for them. I mean, that's not what the other engineer said. I, I, I don't know. That's not, I mean, that's not my forte. If we can't, if, if that can't work, then we'll look at something else. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, wait through the process of years of HMGP. But, you know, I, I, I have to take the, you know, the lowest hanging fruit is try to work with the asset that the people own, which is already existing. And I'm told that I can do that relatively quickly. And that's what I want to try to do to expedite that. If that doesn't work, then we'll look at something else. And that's not been something you've been told before. Not by me. I'm not sure about before. But. Well, Skip, I, that's, can, candidly, that's a very good question. Well, candidly, that's a very good question. I got a different answer this time from the county engineer than I'd gotten previously. That's within the last week, two weeks, literally. Skip, I don't know. Engineers have different opinions. You should, you should know. You say, I don't know. You should Whether it's a week or two weeks, I'm not sure, darling. That's what I'm saying. I'm not sure if it was a week or two weeks. But we've asked many times before about what I can do with that pond and was told there's nothing else I can do. Now I'm told there is something else I can do. I don't know what the, why that answer changed. I mean, but that's what, I mean, for five years. So the design for it was estimated at ten or $15,000, which means that's something that is 
either in procurement now or can be done in procurement in a couple of weeks. And then it would go for construction. I've got an estimate. For well, it's, well, I'm, 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 you know, I'm sorry you feel that way, but you do have neighbors, and because I now have been told that I can do something with that pond, as, you know, whether that makes, whether that makes you happy or not, I'm going to continue moving forward with doing something with that pond, whether that helps, whether that makes it happy or not. Skip, I've never told you that. I've never, t because I've been, Skip, you're, absolutely. So I'm a lay person, and when I ask, what else can I do with that pond, nothing, there's nothing you can do. Was told that year after year after year. You've not been told by me that there was anything going to happen to that pond before. I'm telling you now, I'm being told that we can go 13 feet deeper. We can dig out some of the sides and have it function at a higher rate. That's what I'm saying. This is tape. Skip, I, I don't want to argue with you. I understand. He does, he does know. I understand. I understand, Skip. Thank you. Sure. Yes, sir, Bob. Okay. Mr. Campbell and I are here tonight about our situation with our industrial property, supposedly industrial property, at American Concrete Supply. Okay. Uh, sent you a a letter this past week with exhibits in it and I thought I was pretty straightforward in my explanation of what our situation was. Horace called me this afternoon upset and don't get me wrong, I have a lot of respect for Horace. Yeah. He's a great guy. But he just doesn't understand our point. Our zoning and future land use was taken away from us by the county and we simply want it back. Okay, and I, I did get the letter. I, the county attorney was out. The county attorney was out last week, so I wasn't able to talk to her about it. And I, we haven't had a board meeting since, so I haven't been able to talk to Horace or anybody. So you currently have HCLI, and you want industrial back. Is that correct? The permit is applied in 1999 for industrial, for a concrete plant, right. and an asphalt plant. It was later changed to HCLI, Heavy Commercial Light Industrial, which requires all manufacturing to be completed within the confines of a building. 95% of our work is outside of a building. Yeah. Concrete plants just don't go inside buildings, large ones like we have. Wouldn't that have affected the pipe plant next door too? Yes, it would. Okay. The, okay. In, entire parcel of 64 acres okay. was approved by the county in 1999 and it should be restored. Okay, we, we, and like I said, I, I got the letter Friday maybe, I mean literally Friday. Um, I, I haven't been able to talk to anybody from the county about it. It seems like a pretty easy doable thing, but I'll, you know, I'll be happy to look some more into it and you know, it does, that doesn't seem like a really big, like a really big step. Was it changed in 2015 when the land development code was rewritten? Is that what your, is that when it changed? It changed uh, with Lloyd Kirk. The first change was Lloyd Kirk. Okay. I, Bob, I'm okay. Let let me let give me a, a, a little bit of time to look at it. I'll be happy to help. I, I, that doesn't seem like something that's that's that that's that high of a bar. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bob. Yep. Taking our attention ponds. 
Cricket Ridge, you still haven't addressed that one, but I'm not going to get into flooding because you've already got your more than your hands full with flooding right now, and it's absolutely ridiculous hearing from all these people here. What I'm going to get into is first, why did you fire Janus Gilly and still pay her? We need to know that specifically. Don't give us a little dog and pony show, and don't say you don't want to do dirt, you know, throw out the dirty laundry. We, the people, want to know why she was so bad, and if she was so bad, in your opinion, why did you let it carry on and not be transparent? But another question, why, can you, why can't you email? Why can you not communicate? There's a lady in here. Do you have to have special clout in order to get an email? Or do, we, do I have to disagree with you every time in order to get text messages? Extremely disgusting that you cannot email. I asked you several questions two weeks ago at the BOCC meeting and the public forum, and you decided not to answer one single question. Now, here, answer a question. Why do I always have to cut the grass on county property around a retention pond? My neighbor here, he sees it happen. He cuts it too. So I tell you what, you can drop off a nice riding lawnmower at my house this week, okay? Because for 12 years now, I've been cutting that outside because I noticed that the county doesn't put any emphasis in public safety nor the infrastructure. That's obvious with the flooding going on. It's called urban sprawl, and you're enjoying it. Speaking of enjoying it, are you going to enjoy that new retirement plan that you forgot to sign at the beginning, but now you want it back, and you took the county attorney with you to Tallahassee to get it all doctored up and bring it back, and nobody else knew that you did that? Why won't you talk about that? That was another question you got. You ready? Okay, are, are you done? Oh, oh, no, actually, you're right. Yeah, go ahead, smile. Um, sure. Another one, you like to play the victim. Stop playing the victim. Stand up for yourself. Start emailing everybody who emails you. Start becoming a communicator. You're on your third term. What have you gotten accomplished with Rhodes? You, when you ran against other people who were trying to run against you, you bragged about how many roads you paved. You know what? There's a lot of roads. West King, or uh, yeah, Kingsfield Road, desperate need. And when you pave roads, why don't you think ahead? Yeah, West Roberts needs to be uh, uh, paved. When you decide that you're going to approve a road to get paved, why don't you think about making it, improving it, wider shoulders? Two years ago, you said you couldn't widen uh, West Roberts Road. You couldn't put shoulders in there because there wasn't enough right of way. In a matter of minutes, I called up the transportation, the engineer, and they said, oh yeah, we got tons of room to put in a shoulder. You got to focus. You got to work with the other staff. You got to let us know. Do you even do a week or monthly email? Okay, that's enough for now. That's about five or six. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, we talked about the administrator at the board meeting 10 days ago, Sean. I, I, I'm not going to say any more than I said that day. Sometimes, uh, you know, I would put my relationship with Janice over 20 years with anyone that was in the room. I've known her very well. She's been a very close friend. We talked for 35 or 40 minutes the day before. Um, I was very candid with her. It was as pleasant a conversation as that can be. And um, that's where the content of that conversation is going to stay. There were four other, Sean, I'm not going to argue with you. You ask questions. Sean, Sean, you ask questions. I'm answering your questions. Please have a seat. No, I'm not going to argue with you. Um, your holding pond, you shouldn't have to cut the areas by your holding pond. Um, I got a text message from you about the maintenance for the holding pond, and I forwarded that. It was my understanding that the holding pond got cut. Um, that's, that's, well, I mean, that's, that's, was my, that was two weeks ago? No. Well, you shouldn't, sir, you, you, should, you shouldn't have to cut the areas by your holding pond. Well, you shouldn't have to, regardless of whether you mind or not. Um, so, and every email that I get from you, I forward it. I make sure that you get a response that's necessary. Um, you know, if you send me text that, that includes something that's about, you know, this issue or there's a pothole here or something, I make sure that those go to the places that they go. Um, okay, well, all right.
that's answer, Sean, that's, that's Sean, that's answering your question. Okay. Thank you. Larry, sure. Okay. With your the uh, high speed internet, the you know, the the wire, whatever, all that high tech stuff, uh, you basically said, and I'm not here to get you, uh, you basically said you, you feel like it's a human rights issue now to have high speed. I just want you to know, just like when East UA took over, the county took over the garbage, the water, you know, it was private before then, mid-80s, you know, and look at the problems we have now. You're up here getting your heads torn off. Same way, you know, I mean, if, 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 uh, if high-speed Internet becomes a, uh, same way with the flooding issue, if high-speed Internet becomes a human right, I mean, most of the people in this room, I'm assuming, are Republicans. and. Yeah. They're against, they're against free college. Why, why would we be for free internet or government subsidized? Nobody said either one of those things, Larry. But if it's a access, human, access to access to that I, is a right. That, in I my opinion, to. that is become a human right. Access to it. But it has to, it has to be subsidized. Mm -hmm. So whenever it does, that costs all of us in the whole county. That's the only reason why I'm here. But I'm just saying. You have to be careful because this room will be filled full of why isn't why isn't our service working good? Next is just like the East UA rep, you know, hey, we can't get we can't get our stuff done. If, if you ask the government to do more, it will do more. Well, part of the part of the discussion that we had was whether the county had an appetite to be an internet service provider, which would be an actual provider, which we don't as a board. So what it is is we're we're trying to, you know, I mean, yes, it, it is important to me. I need, I need to be successful bringing access to high-speed Internet to my, all my constituents. Mine are the vast majority of those in, in Scammy County that don't have access to it currently. I need to be successful in doing that. Um, that's, not, that's not paying for it. That's just folks having access to it. And the county would not be an, the county would not be an Internet service provider. So, so if, it, if we're not paying for it, the taxpayers, whether it be local, state, or federal, I mean, if you're talking about grants or subsidizing, then, then we're all paying for it again. So, so for the we are paying for, for it. For the construction part of it, I'm, you're, you're talking about the service, the monthly service I'm, and those things. But I'm talking about subsidizing it coming here. So I, 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 I'm not going to get okay. an argument with you on it. Yeah. I'm just saying be careful what you ask for. We'll get more and more of the same government. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Look at me, I'm jumping into the ring of fire. I got my boxing gloves on, Larry, I'm ready. So I just wanted to um, just talk a little bit about that. Broadband is a, is a critical component that we found that we were lacking in a lot of America during COVID. Certainly a lot of parents that were stuck home and their kids stuck home. And we have to get the infrastructure to the home so that we can provide quality internet access, not just internet access. And in doing so, the federal government has created a ton of grant programs that have trickled down into the states. And the state has some funding that they are doing. To my knowledge, the county hasn't committed any of your local tax dollars, but it is something at the state and federal level that they are looking at to help create the pipeline, not the service specifically. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why it hasn't just magically appeared in your neighborhoods is because of your point, Larry. We can't get in the business of providing broadband service to these people. All we can do is try to help facilitate that process the same way that I went and got an appropriations request to help get money so we can fund Century's well water is the same kind of concept that we would be doing for broadband currently is the plan. But we do see that as a Republican led le leadership. We see that and we are trying to address it in a way where we don't get engaged in the process so much that we're trying to be the ones to do it. Further, we are partnering with the organizations, the companies that provide the internet that already have the infrastructure in place so that we're not 
giving them so much money to go out there and create a whole new line of infrastructure, if that makes sense. So it is a process, but it's also a partnership. So I don't, I don't know of anybody that is in the business of, of subsidizing. Um, I will say that there are programs that Cox and other um, ISPs give that are their way to give back to the community where they provide the $14.99, $12.99 a month internet access. But that is led by the corporations. That's not led by the federal government. Does that help some? Yeah, okay. Yeah, oh, I, look, listen, don't get me started. But yes, you're right. And every good program, we just got to do this. I know, I know. The, then the next thing you know, they're doing recycling and everything else. Uh huh. See, I'm <laughs> Larry. We're on the same page. But I just didn't want I, I didn't want the commissioner to be kind of pulling that because that's something that the federal and state government are kind of pushing down. So. Yeah. Yeah. One more thing. Yeah. Sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it seems like that at times. Um, and you know, candidly, for my folks that are on Frontier, if the if the county had if the county had an appetite or any inkling to try to get into uh, to being a provider, we would try to do something with the Frontier network. I mean, it, it's I've gotten numerous emails from folks that say it's going to cost fifty thousand dollars to run to run connection to their house that's half a mile or a mile. I mean, it, it's 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 disappointing and. You know, it's not an issue. It's something, and I appreciate Representative Salzman's comments about it. Um, it's an issue that I often, you know, kind of am by myself on our board to discuss because the majority of the county has access to high speed internet. Everyone may not have it based on their resources or their ability to pay for it, but at least they have access to it. Whereas I've got 10,000 residences, give or take, that don't have access to high speed internet. Um, they have, you have an unserved number that just have nothing, and then you really have an underserved number that's a larger number that the statistics might say they have it, but in reality, you can't, you can't watch Netflix, you can't do schoolwork, you can't do a Zoom meeting, you can't do the things you should be able to do, in my opinion. Um, but, yeah. yeah. Uh, we keep hearing the rumor that there, someone is trying to get Molino Road rezoned for more residential properties. Uh, that concerns me a little bit. I understand the, the building boom. I don't want to begrudge someone from making money, but mm -hmm. when you talk about something as small as Molina Road, you have not the infrastructure on there. The traffic's going to be the issue already from what we've got just from the commercial traffic on the old paddle box. But I'm just wondering if you've heard that, if they were talking about rezoning the whole Molina Road, I think from 29 to the river, or partials of it. I, I have not necessarily heard that. I, I, again, I, I don't dispute it. There's a lot of conversations I'm not necessarily a party to. Um, you know, at, at one point in time, very close to us, there was a, a proposed pit that was close to Shag or off Barnett Park Road in that Shag area. And there were a number of these residences from here that I got petitions about something related to that. That's never, I mean, I'm not saying there weren't conversations about it, but it's not ever anything that came, um, you know, that came to me or came to the board. So I, I, I don't dispute what you're saying. It very well could be somebody trying to do something on Molina Road. I'm just not, uh, I'm not aware of it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that that would be that would be a pretty high level of density for that area. That would be a little surprising, but I, I, I again. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, sir. I'm, I'm not aware of that. And again, and that seems especially if you're talking about Molina Road, literally Molina Road, not just Molina broadly, but literally Molina Road. That seems pretty dense for that area. But, yeah, Brian. 
cut them down. Um, why has the VOCC devoted so much time, or haven't, you haven't devoted as much time to the public safety issue as you do other issues? I sat the other night and watched y'all talk about 401A, and I'm not here to talk about that, but I'm bringing that up to yeah. kind of preface my point here. Um, you spent 30 minutes, almost, well, quite a long time. I've never heard a discussion about improving public safety other than let's go and give them lunch, let's cook them breakfast, let's get a food truck or whatever else. That hurts. Been in public service for 30 years. Um, I was a volunteer, again with, I was a career farmer in 2000. And it's always the same thing ever. And Larry alluded to it, when are we gonna get there? You've been telling us, and, not, and I say you, I say the Board yeah. of County Commissioners, yeah. when are we gonna get there? We've had no new fire stations. The only reason we've had an increase in personnel in fire stations is because of tragedies. Um, I'm going to speak to the homeowners for just, just a second as well. If you live within five driving miles of a fire station, you essentially have no fire protection. Your ISO rating decreases, your home insurance increases. Okay, so you either pay a little bit every year on your property tax or you get hit with the homeowner's insurance, regardless of where your hydrant is located on your street, which is another thing that infrastructure is suffering is the hydrants. I know that's not your department. That's Mr. Stevens' department, and I'll be talking to him about that later on. But there's 14 different water companies up here. I digress. Uh, I listened to a number of county employees talk about the understaffing and the lack of pay and everything else. We just had a county attorney jump ship. I don't know if it was for pay or if he was getting out while the getting was good. I don't know. But the city just got a 15% bonus, city employees, the, first, the firemen and the responders through the CARES Act on their salary. And they also got a pay increase. Where is the county on that pay increase as far as that goes with the CARES Act? And why haven't the Scambia County employees, especially your first responders, received that yet? Is it laziness? Are you unwilling? Y'all don't care? I don't understand. I tend to think that you don't care because we get the same answers. Well, we're working on it. I'm tired of hearing that, working on it. I couldn't speak before because of fear of retribution and retaliation and whatever else. I'm not, not that's done. Um, and my last question is, Aren't roads and bridges, weren't they responsible for the ponds and everything else? Is that correct? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So this is my last question, and I'll sit down. What makes Mr. Marino qualified to be interim county administrator? He couldn't answer the damn question. So where's, I would like for you to have referred to, deferred to him as far as to answer some of these pond questions of why we're having so many issues with flooding year after year. And the flooding taxes, ask that man right there, We've been to every flood together since it's happened. Thunderstorms that come through and dump torrential amounts of rain, flood neighborhoods. We go to people, cut the roofs, get them out. But hey, y'all did a great job, pat on the back, good deal. But should never increase the funding other than personnel. Our budget has increased because we've had to hire more people, which includes uniforms, have some gear. And yes, we purchased new fire trucks. Well, we're about the lemon law, two of them, or just one, just one. Crappy manufacturer, I guess. I don't know. But these guys are riding. The engine I left was pushing 140,000 miles. Molino just got a new fire engine. They don't run a tenth of the calls that we would come up here to run, and that's Cantonment Station 4. We run 15 to 20 minutes to Crabtree Church Road, up off Brickyard Road and everything else for cardiac arrests, medical emergencies, high-level medical emergencies that EMS can't get to because they don't have people. You got a lot on your plate, I understand that. Public safety is not your only issue. Yeah. It's not my only issue. <clears throat> but the priorities of the BOCC seem to be a little askew. So. so I do think that it's something, you know, we did talk about it a couple weeks ago as far as specifically fire issue. I mean, that is something that's going to, uh, that the board is going to have to take up in a more active manner, and I think that we all recognize that. Part of it's related to the, uh, to the fire MSBU funding. There's, you know, we have, we have issues with the fund. Um, um, so we're having to take that up. We are, you know, and it's, I mean, ultimately it's the board's fault, um, you know, regardless of, regardless of anything else. Everything, everything is the board's fault. I mean, we're like... So
So. So we need you as a POCC yeah. to protect those brothers and sisters that are out there still humping it with three people on an engine. Y'all wouldn't have three people on the board. If you're down a staff member, I'm sure you suffer, but not as much as these guys and girls out here humping on a fire truck or an ambulance. That needs to be addressed first and foremost. So, <coughs> excuse me. So what I was referencing as far as the board, you know, what's, the, what's been a board issue, uh, you know, clearly. We have a few collective bargaining agreements, and we don't have, none of them are current. They're all, they're all expired. They're all expired. Um, yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me, they're all expired, and we've, we've got to make some progress with the, with the collective bargaining agreements. Um, I don't know exactly, honestly, Brian, I don't know exactly what, what the solution is because, you know, we end up, there are, uh, you know, there are certainly staffing issues, but that's not the primary issue that, uh, you know, that we, that we hear. And, uh, you know, I know staffing? staffing not being the, that's not the, that's not the primary issue that the board, that, that the board. Part of, so part of the issue is that's not that 1079. There's nobody. Uh, there's there's nobody that makes that, and I don't know that that's. I don't know that those comments are in good faith, as far as between the board and and trying to work with a collective bargaining agreement with the with the fire union. Um, there are a lot. I mean, we have. In, the 1079, we have, we have a number of employees that might make, you know, their, their wages might say $18, $19 an hour, but their total wages per year are $80,000, $85,000, $90,000. Thank you. No, I had two more questions. I'm sorry. What, what were the, okay. Um, I guess I'm not going to get a complete answer on that. Um, I guess they were satisfied with the, with the, with the question, but um, with the, the holding ponds and things of that nature. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so. I've worked that. What, yeah, how, so. How is he qualified? Can I answer the question? To step in okay. the county administrator when there's two other ones. Uh, I'd just like to know how that decision was. was yeah. So, 
And the reason I didn't ask Mr. Moreno questions about the, the design and the planning for the ponds, Roads and Bridges is who maintains the ponds, but engineering is who plans and does project management. That's not a Roads and Bridges issue. What Mr. Moreno has been tasked with is to maintain the assets that are on the ground in the way that they are. That's not, hey, look, that's not the way we should have designed this. That's not, well, it would really be better if we had another acre on this pond. It's go maintain the assets that are on the ground now. And uh, to the majority of the board, Mr. Moreno has been a, you know, clearly a very good public servant for a number of years, and he had relationships and confidence of the majority of the board. That's how he ended up being the interim administrator. I mean, that's, that's I can only speak for myself. That's my, I mean, that's the. All right, what was the other question, Brian? Oh, and the last thing, you made mention of that you didn't have very good coverage. You haven't had very good coverage in District 5. Um, and I, I, I quoted you, but then I did mention that you said that career coverage has improved. Um, you've always had fire protection since you've been in office. You took office in 2012 after a majority of the service, um, career fire stations were serving a majority of District 5. Station 6, BLS in 2010, which 90% of that district falls in District 5. Station 4, ALS engine, January 2010, they're an ALS uh, crew. Um, Station 7, which is Ferry Pass, which serves UWF in a very dense urban population, including the ACLFs and the like, are in D5. Um, and Station 1, which came on, those two stations came on after you were there, and they responded to District uh, 5 with 4, 6, and 7. So you, you've been served well by the MSBU in career fire protection. As it, has, as it has changed over years. And, you know, the budget, you know, you mentioned the budget. The budget's also gone, you know, from, I don't know, $10 million a year to $17 million a year over that period of time because of, you know, bringing on personnel. Um, I think one reason that there's been such a need to bring on personnel is I, I don't know that we've had a, an environment that fostered volunteerism. Um, we can talk about that, too, and I can that. Okay, well, we, we, we can talk about it on, online. I mean, you're, you're an expert in it. I'm not. I'm a layperson. Um, but it, as a layperson, it doesn't appear as if we've had that type of environment, but we, we can circle back with that. But um, I think... That's the thing that concerns me as well. D1 through D5 is, and I, I hate to use this term because it sounds derogatory, but the ignorance that the board has on the basic necessities of public safety. You don't understand how the EMS system works. Let me digress. When somebody calls 911, you don't have a basic concept of how when this person picks up 911, and ask a request assistance for an emergency to the end to the end result of when they either get their problem solved or some or turns out a different way. That to me shows that there's no concern there from the from the board. And that that really that bugs me. That okay. that doesn't that, I'm just I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of the Brian, guys Brian, that have been say it louder. What's not I'm sorry? Say it louder. Which part? <laughs> And you, you, true, that's how we feel. And I know we're in negotiations and everything else, but that's another thing. There, there, there's been, well, because of COVID, well, because of this, well, because of that. There just seems there's no genuine concern to move forward to make this, this fire service in Escambia. We had 25 candidates that would beat down the door 10 years ago, even close to five years ago. You know how many, we've had maybe that many in the last three or four hiring rounds. My numbers may be a little off, but... I sat on interview boards where it was from Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, all day long. Well, I do. I have a, a lot of confidence in Mr. Gilmore, and, uh, you know, I have known him 15 years. And he tells me we've got good folks, you know, in leadership now at EMS and at FIRE. I'm going to trust him in that. I trust his ability to manage those, to manage those people as well. And uh, I'm, I'm confident that, you know, by the measures that he's taking, which the board, I, I presume the board is... I, thank you. Okay. We vote right. for candidates to go to District 5 and District 3, 1, and 4, too, because they're quality. We want okay. the same for our public safety. We just don't want a pulse and a, you know, well, our, yeah. we want, you know, I have a, I have a lot of confidence in Mr. Gilmore, and, and, and I believe the board has intentions of supporting Mr. Gilmore as he goes forward in, that, in leading that area. Right. Other folks? Sure. Jamie? Sure. I'll cut some of my questions out because they were addressed, but we don't have volunteer commissioners. We don't have volunteer staff. Volunteers are great to supplement, 
but we need the coverage, we need the firehouses. 1079 is what you have on your own website. It's a, that's what you're advertising for. I've been listening to the collective bargaining agreements. They're asking for $4 more, and that's probably not even gonna make them competitive for some of these other um, agencies that are nearby. So we're talking about fire departments, and you know, uh, Mr. Caro can tell you how much they're paying other places. We're talking about trucks that don't have AC. One, one truck went four to five weeks with no air conditioning in it. Okay. So you didn't tell me that, but someone else told me that. So that's still happening. There's porta potties at the Pleasant Grove one because we can't fix the septic there. There's issues that this is deferred maintenance, this is too low of salaries. I need to know from you, because you know I've spoken about this at public forum and I don't get an answer. I need to know, number one, what is your commitment to increasing these salaries to make them competitive? Because you can say, well, it's because we don't have volunteers, we don't have this, but we have at least 12 openings. That's the proof in the pudding. I don't really care if we're such a nice county, it's, we can live by the beach. There's 12 openings. Like he said, they're not coming to apply. Mr. Gilmore has, I've heard a lot of good things about him too. He's kind of deal with the same budgets as the last guys. It's a county commission issue. Are, what is your commitment to funding public safety, particularly the fire department? It sounds like you're going to increase the EMS service and that's great. But they're, they're also 30 minute waits. One, one woman said she waited on the floor with her husband who had a heart attack for 30 minutes. She said that on a Scambia Citizens Watch, and he died. That, we can't have things like that. You cannot be upzoning in the sector plan and not provide for the fire department first and for the EMS first. You can't have your county attorney, which was directed by you, to get an outside planner for $25,000 so you can change agricultural property to subdivisions <sighs> and not provide for the roads and, and the public safety. That's what we're saying. We're not saying no growth. We're saying public safety and infrastructure has to be first. So tonight I am asking you, what is your commitment to- I think, I think all of the board is committed to, especially on the front end, on the hiring end, you know, the, the new hires on raising those wages. So we, increasing the salary for the fire. For, certainly on the, on the low end. We don't, have, we don't have a retention problem on the higher end, on the higher end employees. You, you have people that left after five years, after 10 years. Mr. Caro can t testify to that too. I hear their stories. We are the training ground. They'll come in, they'll get their experience, then they'll go somewhere else. And that is a waste of taxpayer and money. You're, and that, that makes sense. And uh, that's why I'm saying I think the board is supportive on the, on the front end of raising those, of raising those wages. We are going to, we are in collective bargaining with them, Jamie. I'm not gonna say a certain dollar amount, but I think the entire board is supportive of that. I don't think that's an issue. Why has the salary not increased in 21 years? The base pay has not increased in 21 years. How long have you been in office? How long have these other people been in office? We haven't had an agreement. There, I mean, there hasn't been an active, or a, there hasn't been a past collective bargaining agreement in I don't know how many years. I mean, I, and that's what, and I, okay. 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 All right. Brian. All right. So, Jamie, on the front end, I think the majority of the board is very supportive of raising this, raising starting wages. You know, the public wants more than just volunteers. They want a career station with volunteers supplementing. No one wants to do away with volunteers, just like hospitals use volunteers, but we still have paid sure. doctors and things like that. I'm gonna just touch on the retirement settlement thing. When you found out in 2019 that you could get 49% contributed to your account versus the 834 why didn't you fix that then? Why, when we can't fund for 21 years base salaries, why did you just try and get that retirement settlement, the 49% back paid to you? And why did you just vote to maintain the status quo? That is very upsetting to me when I see 
EMS and I see fire at these low wages, and there's other county employees that are low wages, why is a part-time job, which maybe it's not a part-time job, but it's an $85,000 a year job, getting a 49, now up to almost 51% contribution of their salary in an investment fund, and why is that so, fair? So the board doesn't set those rates, and board, you know, the board, does set the, 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 board the, the way the contract reads, the board sets the rates that are adopted by the, the way the contract read in 2016, which is the current contract. The board adopted the rates that were set by the legislature for those percentages, a grid that was set by them. And um, you know, the issue, to ever bring the discussion forward, I had to get an ethics opinion before I could even bring the discussion to the board about any employees, about any board members, because four of the board members would have been, or four of the board members would be in that affected class. A dozen or 14 senior management employees are in that class. But because a board member or multiple board members is in that class, I couldn't even bring the discussion to our board without getting an ethics opinion. So that's why I did that. Are you asking me a question? Do you want me to answer? Or? Well, you're, you're framing it the wrong way. Only if okay. benefited you, did you have to get another one? Correct? No, to bring the issue to discuss the issue on any level, I had to have an ethics opinion. And to be clear, whether a commissioner participated in the, I mean, Commissioner Bender had been in the program for a couple of years. So we'll just say Commissioner Bender in this instance. Whether it was Commissioner Bender, Commissioner Burgosh, or I, all three of us, we're, our salaries are budgeted the same. There's no difference in the expense to the taxpayer. The taxpayer, whether a person participates in the investment plan, the pension plan, or the 401A plan, the way it had been done for 25 years, there's no change to the taxpayer what that person costs. I think that that's been something that's been, uh, you know, presented in a, uh, an inappropriate fashion as if, you know, the people that participate there are more expensive or that they're, uh, they're costing taxpayers more. Everyone costs the taxpayers the same. In my opinion, that that was misrepresented. But I'm not going to argue with anybody in the newspaper, nor am I going to argue with you here. You asked a question. That's. You could have realized the savings if you would just have the same amount contributed that would have been contributed in SRS into your 401k. You could have realized the savings if you would have just have the same amount contributed that would have been contributed in SRS into your 401k. So we're, all, we're also, you know, trying to find out more information throughout the state about how other 401As are administered. So, you know, something coming up at the last minute the other night, that's not the way, that's not the way that we need to make decisions. As, as I said, I'll, I'm open to discuss that with my, with my board. That's the way the plan has been in place for 25 years. I didn't know that. I mean, I didn't know that, but apparently that's how the plan had been in place 25 years. I'm open to discussing that with my board, but that's a decision that our board should make well, on an item. Your, your personal position, what is your personal position? Is it that we'll, we'll, well, we'll, dis we'll discuss it. I, I mean, I'm gonna discuss it with my board. I mean, that's, I don't get to make, pers I don't get to make individual decisions. and beaver dams and wetlands and things like that. That's what my concern is with the sector plan. No one is listening to what we're saying. We're not saying there was no development in those areas. Those areas already had three houses per acre. But what I'm afraid that to what happened to these good people over here, what happened to people in um, Bristol Park is going to happen in these areas that do have wetlands. There's a beaver dam on Pine Top Road. You just of, um, approved 70 houses to go over there. There's wetlands on the property, but there's no environmental study done by the county. And then you guys are going to sit back there and go, well, you know, it was before my time. You may not be here. Someone else will be here. I don't want to be that lady. I don't want that for our neighborhoods. You're not taking your engineering your, and your planning and putting them together. You're saying whatever the market will bear, and that's a wrong attitude because new development never totally pays for itself, as we can see with the EMS and the fire shortages. 
Yes, you'll get more taxpayer money for property tax, but it won't pay for everything. This is what I'm asking you to just, this is the first time I've ever had you pay attention to what my argument is. You don't have to agree with me, but please, please, when you are upzoning property, when you are taking the farmlands of Molino and saying that they can now build subdivisions, even if they're four acre properties, are you gonna have the schools? Are you gonna have the firemen? Are you gonna have the EMS ready? Because I'm really scared. My 88 year old mother lives with me. She fell on the floor once, not too long ago, and my husband said, call 911. And I said, oh no, we can't wait that long. That's, that's the fear that residents have. And I'm not making this up. There are stories of people waiting seven hours to have someone, four hours the other day, someone told me, from a transfer from one facility to another. And yes, some of those things will get worked out, but you cannot have uncontrolled growth. And that's, that's the voice that I'm speaking from tonight. So thank okay. you for listening to me. Sure, sure. Billy, sure. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I'll laugh. It says I talk too low, so I probably do. All right. Thank you for coming tonight, meeting everybody. I've heard things tonight that any commissioner in any district would have probably been discussing some of these things, problems, things, challenges throughout this your district and all the districts. And what I would like to encourage you is to think about the priorities. This is your group of county commissioners and the people that's in their staffs. And my, my business, we try to set priorities. First is take care of the customer, service and safety, that's the top. And that's a challenge every day. <clears throat> I know that you got, no doubt, some well-qualified people in this group, and that's not here tonight. You can have a lot of positive input into it. We have some initiatives in our business for that little extra. They have an opportunity to increase their weekly salary for their performance and things of this nature. Uh, be independent, independent to be there because you can't service if you're not there. And it was mentioned several times about the problem with drivers. I was in the service business. We deal with it extremely, very challenging. Right. But as you, as one of the leaders of our county, I would encourage you with your group to set priorities. And maybe you do already, but have true priorities. You've heard some things tonight that should be some real priorities, and they may already be. And you have some people in this group probably can add to those priorities. And we've learned in our business, like I said, there's some people, by giving them that opportunity to form a little better that challenge, they increase their salary. And our goal is to everybody that comes to work for us, we want them to want to stay there until they retire. Because the less turnover, the better it is for us. Sure. And that's a challenge every day. And then we're losing people because somewhere else pays a lot more. That happens. But, and I'd, I'd like to see an encouragement towards the citizens in the districts. Uh, some wants to, some probably don't. But have an opportunity to help the county, to help the county, uh, that challenge. And that's mainly just what I want to say. I think there's a lot of ability in this group, in this county, and as individuals. And if people work together, it's amazing what can be accomplished. I appreciate it. Right. Thank you, Billy. Folks, any other questions? Yes, sir. Mr. Lancaster. SpaceX, he has a system coming out right. that's already uh, developed. They've got permission from FCC to put up 12,000 of their antennas. 
uh, it should be about the size of a, a refrigerator, be 210 miles out, you won't have any dead areas if, once that is implemented. Yes, sir, the Starlink, the Starlink program, uh, Starlink program, I think, maybe what it's called. Uh, part of that. Yep. I think so, okay. Mm -hmm. It is. Yes, sir. But also, Steve, it's never changed in District 5. It just grew bigger right. and harder. You got a real challenge in District 5. I would have the other commissioners attend these meetings with you so they could see the problems that you have. Yeah. We always participated like that, and it worked out. Okay. We were able to help the people in District 5. So, uh, of course, you're brave. You got broader shoulders than I have. Oh I, well, I don't. Hey, uh, in, uh, you know, and I've had. I'd, I've had I, I'd, I'd let the county administrator speak uh, more. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, thank you, Harris. Sure. Appreciate I, it. I've had 40 of these over the over the years, and and tonight I, I've, is the first time that I've had some other elected officials with me. Maybe that maybe I maybe that's another failure of mine. Maybe I should have been doing this from the beginning. Uh, so, the yeah. Advice. Well. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, any other questions? Well. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. I, I, I hope that I hope my demeanor is one that has affected some positive feedback tonight. And I don't thank Kevin and Michelle for both taking part. And thank you for uh, uh, thank you for your civility and asking questions.